I'm very, very fortunate to uh, have a group of people to be with me tonight. And it'll be sort of a roundtable discussion. We might get into a number of areas. First, uh, we have P.J. Sidney with us. Mr. Sidney is an actor, a very competent actor who you've seen on TV many times in motion pictures, the Broadway stage. Eden Gray is with us. Miss Gray owns Inspiration House, the bookstore dealing in... We always refer to them the offbeat books, but that's not in a derogatory way. It's the books dealing with uh, uh, yogi and... Uh, is it yoga or yogi? I always ask this. I'm always confused. Which is the, the practice and which is yoga the... Yoga is the practice. Pra and the yogi is the practitioner. That's is that it? Mm -hmm. Well, she deals in both. You can either get a yogi or a yoga there. It depends right, on yeah. if you want. If you, if you want one who's practicing, fine. If you want to read a book and do it yourself, you can get it. And uh, we... <laughs> And hypnotism and what have you. And we have uh, Roy Schatt with us, photographer. I've invited, and I'm very delighted that we were able to have this gentleman come tonight because this is sort of a last-minute notice, uh, the Reverend Walter R. Martin. Uh, Reverend Martin is assistant professor of biblical studies at the King's College, Briarcliff, New York. He's also a recording artist with the Audio Bible Society of America, as well as an author and a lecturer. In fact, a couple of books were brought to my attention. This is a booklet series. One was sent to me by one of our listeners, and that's how I became acquainted with uh, Walter R. Martin. I have uh, four of these uh, booklet series here. One is on unity, the other on Christian science, Jehovah's Witness, and Mormonism. And uh, there's one hardcover book, which is titled Essential Christianity, subtitled A Handbook of Basic Christian Doctrines. I was just wondering, uh, Reverend Martin, are you in a position to be uh, objective about all of these different religions? Well, insofar as anybody who is examining any body of evidence is concerned, I suppose I could be objective. Of course, everybody is, to some degree, uh, prejudiced by their own conviction, their background, their mm -hmm. studies. I don't know mm -hmm. anybody that isn't. Mm -hmm. So if you're going to say, is there such a thing as pure objectivity, uh, I have never found We're it. We're not going to have it tonight. I doubt it, <laughs> from me or anybody else, for that matter. <laughs> Tell me this. Let's take any one of the four. Let's just... Uh, let's take the... the booklet series on uh, Christian science. Uh, has there been any criticism on this? Oh, well, um, when the initial book came out from which that pamphlet is drawn, The Christian Science Myth, the uh, Christian Science Publishing Society in Boston, the ch Mother Church, uh, sent down one of their top men with, uh, I think it was about seven pages of alleged corrections in the material itself. They were very unhappy that I had pointed out that Mrs. Eddy, while vigorously teaching that there is no such thing as pain, uh, used morphine for over 30 years. Mm -hmm. And they didn't like this very much. And uh, I pointed out that Mrs. Eddy's... Uh, theological views she was perfectly entitled to. I wasn't challenging her right to hold them, but it seemed a little bit inconsistent to be telling people there was no such thing as pain while one was taking uh, drugs for pain and receiving injections, and uh, they got quite upset about it and sent somebody down. And we spent two days in the Hotel Commodore discussing it. After we got through with the uh, five or six pages of material, we boiled it down to one mistake which was in the book that could be proved, and that happened to be the date of Mrs. Eddy's mother's death, which was quoted from one of their books, and so I hardly think that that would be a mm -hmm. serious challenge. Well, the, the series that you wrote, the Modern Cult Library, uh, you are... Well, certainly not implying, but you're almost saying it, that, that you sort of frown on the various uh, religions that you have written about. Is this the entire series? Or well, there are, there are seven more? books, and uh, there are about seven, there's seven books, and I have a master textbook of 600 pages, which will be released in this, this fall. And then uh, I've written for numerous magazines on the subject. But well, your, all right, go ahead. I'm you want me to answer the question directly, so I will. Um, I don't know if I'm if I'm happy. I even ask it now, but go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, let me put it this way. Um, Try to ease out of that place. Thing. You're supposed to force another one, but go ahead. Now I'm stuck with it. I'll I'll we'll take we'll, we'll, your answer. We'll try to be as gracious as, and quick as we can. Uh, uh, I'll just say this. Uh, I don't frown upon any of the religions that I have uh, studied or written about from a standpoint of their right to hold their belief. This is their own. My basic critique is, of course, historic Christianity. And if
if somebody's going to claim to be a Christian and then contradict basic Christian theology, then I think somebody ought to point out the inconsistencies. This is all I've done, and uh, if this is to be construed as frowning on them, why, I suppose anybody who's ever written in this vein is frowning. What's going on at King's College? That's what I'd like to know. What are you selling there? Uh, well, we're uh, selling, in a manner, uh, liberal arts education. Uh, well, let's get back. I'm sorry, then I should have uh, uh, continued with that question by asking this. Uh, what happens in the, the course of biblical studies? Well, in our curriculum of biblical studies, we are a Christian liberal arts college. That is, we have a definite viewpoint on education. We believe that uh, not only should you give a liberal Christian uh, liberal education, liberal arts education, but uh, we also believe that uh, we should give a Christian interpretation to this. That is, the charter of the college was founded on that basis. And uh, in our Department of Biblical Studies, we attempt to integrate as part of the study of English, the English Bible, which is great literature, and we bring in the philosophic implications of anti-Christian thought, anti-theistic thought. We teach a course in apologetics, introductory and advanced exegesis of biblical uh, data and comparative religions. It's uh, a fairly well, we hope, a well-rounded presentation of the relationship of religion to the contemporary world. Mm -hmm. What are you for? Jesus Christ and his gospel. Well, wouldn't you say, and without pointing out why I have made the mistake, which I imagine you're going to tell me, but I was under the impression that all of these books that I have here, all of these doctrines, also believe in that. Well, that's the very point of the writing of the books. Uh, See, I, I, didn't, I received these books. One was sent to me by mail. That's where I heard of you, and I didn't even have a chance to go through it. And the other three you were kind enough to bring me, and I haven't even had a chance to to break open the book except to read the title. Well, may I put it this way, and perhaps it'll clear some of it up. Uh, there's a great body of people extant in the United States and abroad, uh, religions which had their origin primarily in the United States, Mormonism, Christian science, unity, and so forth. Now, all of them have one common factor. They all claim that they are Christian, and you can read their uh, publications in the newspaper and so forth. All I've done is to say, is there a criterion for determining what is Christian? And I have placed their material beside the historic criterion of Christianity, if you will, Roman Catholic theology and Reformed theology, which would be historic Christianity. And I find, and I have found, not only myself but quite a few others, that there are quite a number of discrepancies which would rule them out as being Christian. Therefore, they're cataloged uh, as sects or cults by such men as Marcus Bach, who's a very well-known uh, writer on the subject, Charles Braden, uh, quite a number of people have written, mm -hmm. not just myself, on the subject. Uh... You're a Baptist minister. Yes, I am. Are there any other groups? I don't imagine. Of course, there's three other books that I haven't got here. Is there one uh, that's a part of the modern cult library on the Baptist? No, but I suppose that you could probably <laughs> dig up some Baptists who would fit into a cultic category if you looked hard enough. I see. Uh, Otherwise, as, uh, you, this could not. You could write a book on that particular religion, but it would not be a part of the modern cult library. Not if we are defining a non-Christian cult. This is precisely uh -huh. what we're defining. Do you have one on Judaism? Uh, well, we don't consider Judaism a non-Christian cult. This is a world religion, which is the root of Christianity. Mm -hmm. It's not a cultic system because Judaism acknowledges what Christianity acknowledges, that there is only one God that the Torah and the law, the law, the prophets, and the writings of the Old Testament are the word of God. And Christianity builds very soundly and, I think, consistently upon historic Judaism. So we could hardly consider Judaism to be a cult when this is the wellspring, prophetically speaking, of Christianity. Mm -hmm. What do you think about Judaism? I believe you think you've said enough about it. <laughs> no, I'd be happy mm. to say a lot more about it. Mm. Uh, I believe that uh, modern Judaism, particularly the return of Israel in 1948, is an identical point-by-point -point fulfillment of a prophecy made by the prophet Ezekiel, a Jewish prophet, in the 37th chapter, in which he details point-by-point -point the return of the Jews to their own land. He brings them back from the various nations where they are buried, according to the biblical language, and uh, they are placed in their own land. This is a prophecy uh, literally 2,000 years before the event itself took place. I believe this is uh, prophetically valid. I believe Judaism gives us the foundation of Messianic prophecy through which we have come to the Messiah, the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, I believe that Judaism crucified the Son of God because, as the Apostle Peter points out, they did not know who they were dealing with. And they crucified him because they didn't know. Well, where's the Roman? Where are they? The Romans, uh, 
the Romans did not crucify Christ in the sense of the actual guilt of delivering him. Uh, I might point out uh, to illustrate this that there seems to be today a great movement on to absolve historic Judaism of the crucifixion. And everybody seems to be getting in line to absolve Judaism of it. Now, um, personally, I think if you're going to be honest, you'll have to go to the findings of the Jewish Supreme Court in Israel in the case of Adolf Eichmann. When Eichmann appealed that he himself had not executed anybody, but that he had merely delivered them for execution, the High Court of Israel ruled, and Time Magazine carried this, that the guilt of a person who delivers an innocent party is sometimes greater than those that crucify. So by the own decision of the Israeli court, they would place the guilt for Christ's crucifixion upon themselves. I'd like to say something on this because as a matter well, of... What is your name? Uh, my name is sometimes... <laughs> sometimes I go into P.J. Sidney and then there are other times when I'm ducking the tax collector and I use another name. <clears throat> uh, as a matter of fact, I had made a note to comment on this matter, to ask your, uh, your opinion about uh, the responsibility for who killed Christ. Uh, we've had on the show several times religionists who uh, have said, when we've said, uh, how do you explain that certain things were done by Christians? They say, well, you see, these were individuals. They were not the church. They were just individuals. They were just renegade individuals, and they didn't represent the church. Uh, Christ was a Jew. And apparently there were some Jews who are held to be responsible for uh, his death. Now, how does that become the responsibility of Jews as a group? How can we not then say that these were not, uh, this was not the Jewish group, these were just some Jews? How can we do this with Christians? And we had, there was a Christian gentleman on about uh, a couple of weeks ago, and he completely washed his hands of the responsibility for what uh, some Christians had done on the basis that, well, these were just some individuals who were just bad, and they were just not following the rules. I find this very odd. I myself, sir, uh, so that I can identify myself beyond my name, I am not a believer. I'm not myself a Christian, and uh, I am perhaps not a Christian for the reason that Gandhi is reputed to have said to some of his English friends who asked him to embrace Christianity, and he said, I would but for those who bear the name. Perhaps my objection goes a little bit beyond that, but uh, that is a great part of my reason for uh, uh, not embracing it. I might say to you that I was raised as a Baptist. Uh, and uh, in my teens, I discovered that I could not uh, believe any of the things that were being said, and it would not be honest then, it seemed to me, to continue to go under this label since I did not in my heart believe it. Getting back to the first thing we were talking about, the matter of uh, the Jews killed Christ. Uh, <laughs> This has always seemed to me a very odd kind of uh, mental gymnastics on the part of the, the Christians because they worship a Jew. There's no doubt, there's no question. You know, uh, sometimes when people don't want to uh, uh, say that somebody is one thing or another, they say well, he's part one thing or another. He, you know, he's part Jewish or he's part. The Christ was a Jew. There was no part anything. He was a Jew. Now, they worship the Jew. But then they say that the Jews killed Christ. Now, it is possibly true that some Jews killed Christ. On one hand, there was one Jew who was fine enough to be your savior. On another hand, there was another Jew who didn't quite measure up. And I have always been at a loss as, how, as to how you could, for so many centuries, have damned the whole people uh, for this particular unfortunate occurrence uh, when so frequently Christians absolved themselves by saying as the, you know, in the case of the Nazis all say, well, you see, it was just, it, was just, it wasn't me, it was, it was two other guys over there. May I say this at this point, P.J.? There were no Christians at that time. Of course not. And uh, it confuses me, along with P.J., that uh, 
the people who were there were either Jews or they were non-Jews, but there were no Christians. Now, to say that people other than the Jews killed him, you'd have to say uh, the people that were there who were not Jews. No, you just have to say Romans. Oh, you might say just Romans. Now, uh, the argument still insists by some people that it was the Romans. As a matter of fact, the Pope, as you have suggested, the Pope did say that we're trying to absolve, we are trying to suggest to our people over the world that it was not the Jews as such who killed Jesus Christ. It may very well have been the Jews who killed Jesus Christ, but I'm sure none of us today could prove this point. And the word prove is underscored highly. We attempt to prove something that happened two days ago and we have trouble. We, we try, and there are many newspapers that uh, will give you all kinds of reports on the very subject we're trying to discuss as we try to prove something. We're trying to prove whether our friend Oswald killed President Kennedy. And some people will say, oh, come off it. He definitely did. As a matter of fact, his wife today, as you, as you may have seen on TV, uh, said that there's no doubt that he did. And yet there is a doubt in all our minds. I have this to say, that people may build religions on all kinds of things. And uh, many of the reasons why we have religions is because we're against something, not necessarily for something. Uh, people have often... Uh, gathered together, made wars together because they were against something and because they were against something they found out what they were for. They were for each other who were against some particular thing, to be sure. If I understand you correctly now, and as I understand uh, the PJ, the problem is... By the way, I'm Roy. Uh, Roy, Roy Schell, uh, that's right. The problem is the crucifixion of Christ. Yes. Uh, now, pardon me. May I just butt in for a minute? <clears throat> then you can answer her too, I think. Uh, Reverend, Walter <laughs> Try, <Martin. anyhow. laughs> Reverend Walter Martin, why do you and the rest of you keep saying Christ? It seems to me that the name Jesus is uh, the better one. Jesus became the Christ. In other words, the spirit within him shone so strongly. Uh, but we often... Uh, say, and you know because the, these books that you have written that the Christ is the spirit that is within all of us, isn't it? Wouldn't it be better to, in referring to him, just to say Jesus instead of the Christ? Well, now, we've introduced a number of things, and the best thing to do is try and take them one at a time if I can remember them, because... Uh, I think we should be fair and let you answer. <laughs> I want to just ask one question of Eden. Eden, do you think it, it, is, it is wrong to refer to Jesus as Christ? No, no, I don't think it's wrong. You mean you should always say Jesus Christ? Well, we're talking about the man now that was crucified. The Christ lives on forever. Jesus, as a man, I, I don't think did. Uh, in other words, there is supposed to be the Christ, the Son of God, within each one of us, isn't there? And so we don't, you know, I mean, you could be, if you got a little more spiritual, you could be John the Christ, or we could say Roy the Christ. But in referring to you, we'd say John. Are you being critical of, uh, of my religious uh, persuasion? You said if I became a little more religious, is this a criticism or is this just... I didn't say more religious, I said more spiritual. More spiritual, I mean. Is this an analogy or uh, a criticism? No, dear. I I'm just, just stating facts. Know, just just stating facts. Here's Facts, honey. I will take that. Um, I must take it again. I'll get, I'm sorry, Mr. Martin, but really, why do you insist that Christ is in all of us? I have this question before you go further. Because the Savior is within all of us. There is a Savior. So? I say so. Uh, many people say so. The Christian scientists say so. The un unity people yes, say we so. Have, we Wouldn't have it be more? I have share. one problem here. We have asked a series Jewish of questions, yes. and we have now departed into a series of propositions irrelevant it's to the question. It's obvious you've right. never heard that's this show before. Uh, oh, I've that's heard the show. Far for the show. <laughs> I've heard the show. That's why I'm trying to stop it before it gets any further. <laughs> Mr. Because, Martin, because please. Because what's going to happen in the end is we're going to say, what happened to my question? Don't change the format of the show. That's the secret of the success. He wants to reform us. <laughs> no, I'd, I'd just like to uh, insinuate that 
awful possibility of a logical consistency in answering, and then we can go back to discussing right. it. Where'd you get the, this fellow? I don't uh, know. <laughs> he's a good guy. I like him. Go on, man. Uh, can, I, can I go back to this? All right, please do. You right. raised a, a very good question before, PJ, and uh, Roy raised a question, and then, of course, Eden raised a question. So there I'll try and... question on Eden's part. She's an affirmation. That's, that's, that's an affirmation. Right. That's right. Which impugned the, uh, the philosophic and religious uh, honor of our moderator, uh, John. So uh, I'll step in and uh, defend, in, in defend, defend in this one position, so far as I can, anyhow, because as I listen to him, I've yet to be able to figure out what he is. And I've listened a long time. I think perhaps... Uh, he's pretty he's second base. I he's think pretty perhaps, clever, uh, isn't he? He's devil's advocate for whatever looks, at the moment, the best thing. And this is the best way to keep a discussion going. But may I get back to the fact itself? Uh, P.J. raises the question about Christianity and Christ and the Christians and quotes Gandhi. Now, in a book entitled The Mahatma and the Missionary, which brings this very subject up, Gandhi says that he was on the verge of accepting Christianity until he saw the inconsistency of the Christians around him, or some of the Christians around him. And he inferred from this that because he saw this in the Christians around him, and there were a limited number to be sure, uh, therefore Christianity itself must be wrong, and he relegated it to one of the major religions of the world. Now, the logical fallacy of it is that you take a particular instance, a number of particulars, and come to a general conclusion. I run into a few Jews, let us say, who are atheistic, who are uh, violently militant uh, against uh, Moses and the Torah, who make fun of the Talmud, who don't keep their dietary laws. So I immediately take the particular instances of my few Jews and come to the general conclusion, Judaism is for the birds. I'm not going to buy it. Well, now, isn't that exactly the same thing that I was saying earlier about this notion about the Jews killing Christ, and I said that a few Jews killed Christ, who himself was a Jew. And I'm asking, and I would like, I think that we would do some kind of explanation as to why Christianity or Christians have embraced this notion for so many centuries, and they have indeed, and they have wrought a great amount of havoc in the lives of Jews because of this notion, and I would like to have some answer for that. Actually, what you're saying is you're asking that the Christians should not be judged on the basis of what a few Christians did, no, which is exactly... That. No, but this is what you're saying about Gandhi. You're saying that Gandhi was mistaken in having arrived at a conclusion from the behavior of a few Christians uh, that were around him immediately. That was what you said. And, and yet, I, what I'm saying is that... On the same the, as on, I would for a few Jews. Yeah, but on the, on the basis of that... I, then I, I ask you, please, sir, to go back to the few Jews around Christ. And I want to know, I want some explanation. And you spoke about inconsistencies. Possibly we'll get into a lot of inconsistencies before we're I'm through sure this we morning. <laughs> and I don't think the inconsistencies are, inconsistencies are going to be confined to, to uh, Christian science and unity and, and a few others. I think it's going to, be conf I, I think it's going to ex extend... To some of your traditional Christianity too, if you don't mind my saying so, and I believe, and I believe, to be seen. and I believe, no, I believe we've already opened up an inconsistency. I, I've tried to uh, on this matter, but you have given me little opportunity to answer it. Fine, uh, you've opened the inconsistency. Yes, but you only enlarged on it by actually no. Uh, I, gave, well, I gave a logical argument for you on the grounds that if I employed Gandhi's reasoning, I could do it with any group of people. And yeah, if but I you, with any you, group you, of you people, I would be wrong. Yeah, but you've employed Gandhi. Not, not if. I say, as a matter of, 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 of historical fact, you, that the Christians have, in fact, followed Gandhi's reasoning in their damning Christ as the killer, uh, I mean, damning the Jews as the killer of, of Christ. Now, just a second. Now, you've assumed something which is yet to be proved. You've said that the Christians have made the Jews, plural now, yes, the Jews have. responsible for Christ. Now, would you cite his, some, some his, instances of this? from your own experience. No. I, I, I want a specific instance where the Christian church, per se, I don't mean a segment of the Christian church, I don't mean one group of the Christian church, I mean Christian theology, from any Christian theological textbook, well, from now, this is important, from right. any theological textbook, well, I'd like to say this, this. may I say this? Let me go right. I'm right. I'm first. All right. Okay. <laughs> You've got me, go ahead. <laughs> All right, fine. Now, I don't propose to cite you chapter and verse from any theological book but I will say to you as a matter of practice, as a matter of Christian practice through all the centuries, Jews have been persecuted on this premise, and apparently they have been persecuted with the sanction of the people at the top in the church. I don't believe that the, that the run-of-the-mill churchmen could have gone off by themselves and done this without some... I mean, if, if, unless the people at the top had had agreed to it, had, had sanctioned it by their silence, and certainly you know that what silence is. Silence gives consent. Uh, 
So I say to you, I have history on my side in this particular thing. And without, I, I don't without feel, without citing enough, history. I don't have any necessity to cite you anything from a book. I cite you practice, sir. Uh, practice by whom? Practice by the Christian communities all over the world. The, 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 the history of anti-Semitism among, in Christian communities all over the world is, is so historically documented, I don't think I have to sit here now and, and give you chapter and verse. Gentlemen, let me... Uh just interrupt here for a moment to take care of some business. This is WOR Radio, your station in New York, 710 on your AM dial and 98.7 on your FM dial, an RKO General Station. E.J. Sidney, Roy Shatt, and the Reverend Walter R. Martin. Reverend Martin? The way you intone that, John, I get the feeling that my neck is being shaved for the knife. Not really. Not really. <laughs> Always uh, the first hour is very pleasant. The first hour is very pleasant, <laughs> and then you're weakened for the rest of the hours. Okay. Uh, let me begin by stating this in answer to PJ. Uh, it would be folly to say that professing Christians have not been anti-Semitic. Uh, it would be folly to say that people who profess Jesus Christ as their savior and have a, an outward form of religion or practice it by going to church and so forth haven't been anti-Semitic. They have, and I don't think anybody can deny it. But it's a long jump from there to the generalization that Christianity has been historically anti-Semitic. Oh. Now, let me finish now. Finish I, I didn't interrupt there, you, so no, you, just, you give me that and then you can chew me in a minute, okay? Uh, I don't want to get sidetracked on the issue of anti-Semitism because I frankly confess uh, with sorrow that Christians, like anybody else, can commit sin. And sin, anti-Semitism, is a form of it. Hatred for any man is not the teaching of the Lord. Now, for us to take the excesses of Christians and through this to impugn Christ is to throw the baby out with the bathwater because Christ never taught this. Now, uh, I do not accept anti-Semitism. I don't know anybody that, as a Christian that I know that does, although I bet I would bet, if I may use the term, that there are people who profess Christianity who are violently anti-Semitic. I wouldn't have any doubt of it at all. But, again, you're doing the same thing I said before. You'll chew me for it, but I've got to point it out. You're taking particular instances, and there are some, and making a general conclusion, all Christianity is anti-Semitic, that Christians are blaming the Jew today for the crucifixion of Christ. The New Testament blames everybody, Jew and Gentile, for crucifying the Son that God sent into the world to save us. He was sent to the Jew first, then to the Gentile. But the Gentile has crucified him by rejection as really as the Jew did by delivering him to Pilate. I have to put yep. this in, but before PJ, you, you stopped me from butting in, and I like to butt in right now, you see? Welcome to the club. And I believe that we are saying, who said the Jews killed Christ? As a matter of fact, why say it? Because it's been said. That's why we say it. Exactly. And we wouldn't say it at all today if, if it hadn't been said for many years. I'm going along with P.J., but I've got to put it in what I call my own simple terms for me to understand. Yes, it's been stated many times. Why would it then people refuse to admit this? Because it's been stated. Obviously, it has been said for a long time in many ways. We have many illustrations of this, and we need not go back to find out exactly where this, thing, this Christ killer, the Jews are the Christ killer, this phrase has been used for many years. Oh, there's no doubt about this. There's no doubt at all, no. and you've heard it. Certainly. Therefore, to find out where it started mm -hmm. or show it to me in a book is a little bit too much to ask. No, I asked for this reason. I am only maintaining one basic premise from the beginning, mm -hmm. that I have no objection to saying that Christians have done this or that people professing Christianity have done this. There's no doubt about this. We're not even arguing that point. Mm -hmm. We're arguing that you can indict Christianity, per se, mm -hmm. for the excesses of some Christians any more than you can in any sense of the term, indict Judaism for the excesses of Joshua and Moses. This would be extremely foolish because uh, there are excesses in Joshua and Moses' behavior, according to uh, critics of Judaism, mm -hmm. who say that they killed children unnecessarily, that they did things which were barbaric and so forth. Well, to take a few instances of so-called barbarism and indict the magnificence of historic Judaism is insanity. Mm -hmm. Why do it with Christianity unless... I think I can, I can say something here, however... Yeah. That if we're talking in 1964 about something that happened a longer ago than 1,964 years ago, and you're talking about Moses at the moment, you're talking about a period that is so much different than ours in what was right and wrong, if you'll allow me, that they did very well not only kill calves... Uh, in order to uh, give them, uh, say, look, Lord, we're killing a calf. But they you. Made the children. But they did, they actually threw, and as a matter of fact, in certain tribes, right today, yes. they do 
throat, not only calves, but children, uh, to, uh, for the, their own God. Yeah. So what I'm saying, in fact, is that we, the so-called civilized people of the world, uh, look back to our forebears, and we better very well say and, and believe it that they were different. And a lot of things that we would call sin today... They were doing a lot of at that time. Well, uh, There's a great uh, difference. I'm, I'm not going to debate the issue of the change in cultural pattern and the differences of our culture in measuring another culture. This we could go into for five hours without even scratching the surface. But I had to is, bring it This is point. cultural anthropology yes. and, and it's, 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 it's a feel all by itself. This is a great evasion from what I was started out saying. And actually, I don't know, uh, maybe I haven't made myself clear, but it is my view that what you've said has actually proven my point rather than disproven it. I say that the, the, the whole concept that Jews, as a race of people, as a tribe, whatever you want to call them, killed Christ, which has been the, 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 the focus of anti-Semitism to a great extent, uh, this was ascribed to Jews because of what some Jews did. Now, you were saying to me in the next breath that... Uh, what some Christians do should not be held against Christianity, you see. And I want to know how something can be sauce for the goose and not be sauce for the gander. It doesn't make any sense to me. So what I started out was, what I started out saying was, I wanted some explanation for the, the reason that this concept has persisted, and it has not persisted just in men's minds. It has persisted in men's actions. To the, yes. tremendous, to the tremendous physical detriment of Jews. In other words, if you just didn't like Jews, that's one thing. But these people have actually been persecuted, and they have been persecuted by Christians. And you ignored another point that I made. Well, I didn't ignore it. I just didn't have just, much chance to get to uh, it, because uh, every time I start dancing, you systematically, uh, you, uh, well, fine. you, uh, I wanna, you I, chop me off on that well, spot. Well, I want so to... I want we're not to, used I, to systematic no, answers. No, no, and, and I, I realize it may be a bit gonna, confusing. And you're going to be with us too short a time to reform us, I'm afraid. <laughs> well, I don't want to reform you. I want to join in, but I, I'd like to have some... Well, you want to join us? Well, you want to... If you can, lick them, join them. Well, you've got to do it all Well, but run in and get your points, right? I would like violently to just get one point in. I've conceded... The basic point that you're making. I conceded this point that you're making. All I'm saying is that you nor no one else can show that Christianity as a religion has ever itself advocated the persecution of the Jews. Look, That's I, all I look, say. I say that the religion is the practice. The religion is as it is practiced. You cannot, you cannot not successfully with me and with a great many other people too, you cannot say to me that the practice is this, but... Actually, we hold aloof from that a body of thought which is inviolate. I say that if you're going to do that, then you have to accept what the communists say. After all, the communist theory is fine. It is? The, yes, the communist theory is fine. What you, is know, the theory? You, you know the basic theory? I don't want to go into it now. I thought you knew it. Well, I but, do. But I just, taught it, but I, I wasn't know what's fine about just it. Just a moment. Oh, it is. Certainly. But just a moment. As a matter of fact, it's very close to Christianity. <laughs> certainly. But, but right. the communist practice is an entirely different thing. And, of course, the communists will tell you, you know, you say, well, you know, you look what you did. Well, I say, you look, there were a lot of hot-headed communists over there, and they really they didn't get word from headquarters, and they behaved badly. You see, but their but basic by, philosophy is to, to annihilate those who disagree yeah. with them. By, They've done that from the beginning. Uh, by this is what the, it grew into. No, that's something no, else. Just a moment now. By their fruits, sir, and I take your word out of your book, by their fruits you shall know them. By your Christian fruits I know you. Mm -hmm. And because, because some Christians persecute, therefore all Christians are persecuted. I also said to you... Is that you, right? You've ignored this. Is now, that right? You've, you've ignored the but, point... But you haven't answered the question. Just a moment. You, you've ignored one point of mine <laughs> that I said to you that, that this has continued with the apparent uh, approval of the powers that be. This is not true. Now, uh, let me, let me <laughs> make this suggestion a moment, please. We, we all we became rather excited in, in trying to uh, have a chance at uh, uh, Reverend Martin to discuss things with him, and we sort of gotten out of turn. We haven't even given anybody a chance. But now, if you will, Reverend, 
make your comments now on these things that you would like, and then I'm I want to go round robin. I'm perfectly Please. willing to. I just wanted to bring that point in uh, of the particular instance and the general conclusion. Now, you're welcome to the conclusion, and I'm not going to debate your conclusion. Uh, all I'm saying is that uh, I don't think it's a logical conclusion. Now, uh, to answer Roy before, and then to recapitulate on Eden, and then mm -hmm. we'll go back to the Fine. round robin, and then at Good. least I've gotten what I want to say, and anyhow, if we don't agree with it. Um, Roy said that at that time there were only Jews, and that the Jews or some Jews crucified Christ, if I, I didn't. I said the, uh, there were no Christians, is what I there said. There were no Christians, that's, that's right. right. Uh, the, they were first known as Christians at Antioch some years afterwards. They were followers of Christ. Of Christ. We'll put it Christ. that way. Followers of Jesus. They were follow well, now I want to get to that in a moment. Oh, come now, wait just a moment. <laughs> I, I must put this in for as a parenthesis. Eden, we know him as Jesus Christ. We can say Jesus and mean a certain person that most of us will understand. We can right. say Christ and mean a certain person. Exactly. I don't know why you can't it's, it's, it's a it's Eden a, is it's very a name for identification. Yeah, that's, that's why I'd like to get to Eden. It's a, it's a, I'll wait till it's, it's my turn. I'm Eden. sorry. I can call you Eden or Miss Gray. And every listener, anybody who's been with us for any length of time, knows I'm referring to the lady who has the Inspiration <coughs> Book House. If we say Jesus or say Christ or say Jesus Christ, I think every listener knows... The individual that we are referring to. It's a common no, term I'm of reference. Let's try. All I'm pointing out is this that the whole world is guilty for the crucifixion of Christ. If, and this is the New Testament record that God sent Christ into the world to save us from our sins. He was crucified, and the Jew who he, who he was sent to redeem was the agency of the crucifixion. But the Gentile world has become as guilty as the Jew in the crucifixion of Christ, speaking historically now, because they, by rejecting Christ, have taken the same onus to themselves by their own choice. Now, let's remember that there are three classes of people, Jews, Gentiles, and Christians. There is the Jew, there is the Goyim, which is the great sea of humanity, and then there is the Christian. Now, the Christian and the Jew, I'm speaking historically in the tradition of historic Christianity, the Christian and the Jew together have stood firm on basic areas of theology. Whereas the church today, the Christian church historically, has become infiltrated by the Goyim. Who I want to know your definition of the word Goyim. I will. The professing believer in the church who goes through, as our friend PJ pointed out before, the profession but does not carry this into the action of the life. Wouldn't you say that was 99% of all people who, uh, who follow the faith? I would say, not, not to say 99%, but I would say a good segment. I would say 99%. Well, because, and I we like won't to quibble say, over fractions. <laughs> I, I will talk about it after you get through yeah. your point. I'm only saying that there is uh, a profession and that there is a confession of life. Mm -hmm. I agree by their fruits you will know them. But mm -hmm. we can become awfully stringent on people's fruits if we make our own ideas the criterion of what a person ought to produce. Now, Very good. where Eden is concerned, uh, no, I we take their may, I, may I finish PJ, please. I'll be glad to, to okay. discuss it, but I want to get to Eden and then we can have a round robin. Uh, Eden objects to the usage of Christ, and I quite understand why. Because in the pamphlet I wrote on Christian science and in the books and research, all Christian theologians that I know, and I, I know quite a few and I've read quite a few, are, are absolutely convinced that uh, Christian science is a form of an ancient philosophy called Gnosticism, in which coming into the Christian church in the first, second, and third centuries, did a very unusual thing. It split Jesus and Christ into two different things. Jesus being the man and Christ being a divine idea which proceeded from the unknowable essence of God and indwelt in every human being. Now, the reason this is erroneous and the reason why the Christian church <laughs> Just a repudiated this. <laughs> Did you see? I, yeah, I, I saw her going to... On, yeah, she went into orbit on that. Yeah. <laughs> We're out of business. She, she's in orbit right now, <laughs> but really uh, you can jump me in a second. <laughs> the reason this is erroneous is simply because Jesus Christos, Jesus, the anointed, uh, Christos is a title of Messiah, which is the anointed of Jehovah. So to say that Christ is a substance or an abstract concept which indwells people is linguistically unknown sound, it will not hold up in Greek or Hebrew, and it has no basis. Are you talking, to, no basis, you talking has, to me now? I'm, I'm talking about to the point itself. Oh, you're talking to Eden now. To the point fact, itself, yes. I mean, can I answer you? Yes, yeah, to the oh. point itself. It will not hold up, number one, linguistically. It will not hold up, number two, historically in Christian theology, because the apostles repudiated this themselves. Well, wait, wait, just and, and let me get my third point in. Third point is, there are no theologians contemporary who will argue for Christ as a separate entity apart from the God-man. We don't worship a Jew, as PJ said before. We worship God manifest in the flesh. And we believe in the doctrine of the Trinity. We're not worshiping a race or a people. 
We're worshiping God in human form. This is what Christianity is, the worship of the incarnate God. Now, uh, I realize that there are people who disagree with this, and we always have liberty for disagreement. But for Eden, or any Gnostic, and this is a Gnostic philosophy, to arbitrarily say Jesus and Christ is to go against the whole tradition of Judaism and Christianity. Well, Reverend Martin... Now, uh, you can fire away. <laughs> Eden, right, pardon yes. me, Miss Gray, what, what would be best, Eden or Gray? <laughs> well, I think Miss Gray would be a little more polite. Oh, watch Whoa. out, pal. <laughs> there we go. Excuse me, Miss Gray. Miss Gray. Well, I meant for Long John, not for you, Reverend Thank you. Martin. Miss Gray, please. <laughs> Uh, now, would you give me... Don't buy your books at Inspiration House. Pardon me, Miss Gray, go ahead. <laughs> I bought some very good books at Inspiration House. Yeah, let's go together. I have, a, I have a library of 8,000 volumes, and quite a number of them come from Inspiration House. Good. Well, good. All right, Eden. Now, may I have your definition of Christ again, what the word means? Yes, Christos is the transliteration... Christos is the transliteration in Greek of the Hebrew Messiah, which means anointed one. Messiah. Yeah, Messiah, anointed yes, one. This, all right. When uh, Jesus was born, he yes. was born with the, um, Jesus or Yahshua or whatever you want to call it. Uh, it wasn't until he took on his spiritual understanding that he was the Christ. Uh, Where would you get this from? Where in the New Testament would you get this from? Well, is he called the Christ at the beginning? Of course. All the way through. All the way through, from the beginning of the Gospels clear to the end. He is called the Anointed of Jehovah. Behold, thou shalt conceive and bring forth a child, shall call his name Emmanuel, Jehovah with us. The Anointed One. Well, Emmanuel is not Christ. Oh, but it is. It's identical with Christ, as your uh, our Jewish friend Roy no, will Emmanuel tell us immediately. Emmanuel means God with <laughs> us, and Messiah means the Savior. Yes, but God with us is the Isaiah prophecy concerning Messiah. So when you link the two together, it's an equivalent in Greek and Hebrew. I know of no Hebrew scholar that would argue a point. You see, the point is this. That, uh, that was the, all right. Let, let's say that you won on that. That's the. First I don't know whether I won you, or not, but that's just a fact. All right. Now all. there are two other points that you made, and I, I didn't write them down. Do you remember what they were? Yes, uh, I said that uh, linguistically it won't hold up. I said the apostles wrote against it in the New Testament. The very view that you're advocating, yes, they I, repudiated. Well, I, I'm not too fond of the apostles. <laughs> <laughs> so funny. I, I, uh, I, I would think, think it'd be they, very difficult to prove Christianity <laughs> if one wasn't fond of the apostles, <laughs> since no, they're the I'm transmissional fond. source of Christianity. <laughs> I think I'm they kind of went. Off the beam uh, a little bit, and uh, that is why I want to get. You mean they were sort of deviationist? Yes, they went right back to their Hebrew. <laughs> they didn't say what Eden wanted her to say. Uh, no, we want to listen to this. I want to say. I would like to hear Miss Gray. I would like to say that I feel that they went right back to the Hebrew teaching and that Christianity now has gotten quite away from what Jesus taught and is mostly uh, just uh, the Old Testament. This is, this is my feeling, an eye for an eye and a tooth for tooth. We've forgotten most of what Jesus said. So I want to ask Reverend Martin uh, what his definition of a Christian is. Because you say that these cults, and I belong to one of them, uh, are not Christian cults. I would define a Christian in the concept of the historical usage of the term in the New Testament and in church history, which I think will stand up under any scrutiny. A Christian is a person who not only follows the ethics and the moral structure of the teachings of Jesus Christ, I would define a Christian in the concept of the historical usage of the term in the New Testament and in church history, which I think will stand up under any scrutiny. A Christian is a person who not only follows the ethics and the moral structure of the teachings of Jesus Christ, but is also a believer in the person of Jesus Christ as the Savior of the world, as God in human form, that he literally died on the cross as an atonement for our sins, and that he rose bodily from the grave as our mediator in heaven. Now, this you is know? following... Uh, let me finish. You asked me for a definition. This is perfectly consistent with the Old Testament concept of Isaiah 53 and of the Jewish concept of the offering for sin, which is the Passover offering. Yes. Uh, now, uh, all I'm saying is, and I don't mean to imply by using the word cult that this is derogatory. I think perhaps well, you've taken offense is. at no, this. Well, I think it is. It's it a dictionary is a term, and I use it in that sense. It's a dictionary term, but it's used in a derogatory way. Well, uh, if, you, if I've used it in that connection where you're concerned, I apologize, but... Do you think I'm looking any, at it merely as a classical usage of the term, that's all. Uh, as a, uh, Reverend Martin, as a teacher of theology, do you feel there's a possibility that the uh, stuff in Isaiah that predicts Christ 
or predicts a savior could possibly have been added a little later or could have meant a spiritual uh, understanding, a spiritual thing that should could come to each person separately? Well, uh, I would answer this by saying that, first of all, the problem of dating of Isaiah is no longer in question. The Dead Sea Scrolls have given us a copy of the Isaiah manuscript as far back as 150 B.C., which means that the antedating manuscripts... And did that have ma- stuff in can the Can I finish? Oh, yes, it did, indeed. So we know that at least 150 years before the birth of Jesus of Nazareth, the prophecy in Isaiah chapter 9, verse 6, which many Hebrew scholars in Judaism are content to ignore, and it's a very difficult passage, I agree. It reads in Hebrew very strongly, and this is what it says. Uh, uh, quoting from Isaiah chapter 9, now verse 6. His name shall be called. This is generally considered by pre-Christian commentators, that is, Jewish commentators, as a messianic passage. His name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Al Gabor, that is, the mighty God. Now, Isaiah gives to a human being the title of Jehovah, the mighty God, Father of the everlasting Prince of Peace. Of his kingdom there shall be no end, and upon the throne of his father, David, that's literal as literal can get, he shall rule the nations with a rod of iron. The zeal of Jehovah of hosts will perform this. First of all, the dating cannot be called into question. And secondly, there is no possibility of a spiritualization because ancient Judaism recognized messianic prophecy. So there is no possibility of a way out of that. I'm not trying to make a case for Christianity having all the answers to everything. I am trying to make a very strong case for the fact that there is an intellectually defensible Christian theology which doesn't really get a fair hearing in many quarters. Well, in our cults, we feel that we have gone back to the first centuries after Christ and are trying to follow his teaching uh, much more than some of the other things that you've added on to to include. But I don't know why anyone that follows the teaching that tries to follow the teaching of Jesus wouldn't be called a Christian. Well, I don't know why we way, have uh, to believe that he died for our sins. Why can't we believe that uh, he was rather stubborn and he knew if he went to Jerusalem he'd get into trouble and he went anyway? Well, uh, may I put it this way? If I, if you, if I give, give a direct answer to this. I'll put it this way. Uh, The only record which we have of the life of Jesus Christ is found in the Synoptic Gospels and the writings of the Apostles. This is your prima facie source material. You have some Roman sources. You have Flavius Josephus before the close of the first century. You have some quotations and the Talmud, of course, afterwards. So the historicity of the existence of Jesus Christ is never questioned, at least by anybody seriously who has read the records. Uh, What we're dealing with, and this is an important point, is that simply because a person follows the ethics and the moral structure of the teachings of Christ does not ipso facto make them a Christian any more than my following the noble eightfold path of Buddhism makes me a Buddhist in Christianity it is first and foremost the person of Jesus Christ which commands the attention of the New Testament writers now if you read from Matthew through Revelation one thing emerges clearly if you're honest you read it in Hebrew or read it in English or read it in Greek it still comes through to you these men experienced something they met a Nazarene carpenter who was very stubborn. As a matter of fact, he was the most dogmatic man that ever lived. He said, I am the Son of God, and if you don't believe that I am the Son of God, then you will be judged into all eternity for my rejection. Now, this was bound to get him into trouble because this is a very dogmatic position. Now, the whole New Testament record presupposes, beyond a question of a doubt, that Jesus Christ claimed to be God in human form. There is no room for saying, simply by following the ethics and morals of Jesus, one becomes a Christian. This will not hold water historically because you can have a system of ethics which resembles Christianity. You can have a system of morals which resembles Christianity, but you cannot have Christianity. And I know people who are very, very sincere in practicing, let us say, the Sermon on the Mount, attempting to keep the ethics and morals of Christ in the New Testament. But this is not enough because the Master said that I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but by me. Now, I agree this is dogmatic. But well, I then also we get, say then that we, we must admit that it's Christ's teaching. We just can't ignore it. All right, so then uh, we get Reverend Martin to the interpretation, and if you've read these different pamphlets, if you, you wrote these different pamphlets, uh, I am the way, the truth, and the life, didn't you say? Yes, I did. I'm uh, quoting Christ, John 14, yes, 6. Yes, Now, we feel that when he said, I am, he meant something different from what you think he meant. Well, what we must do is look in the context and find out what it means in the language. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Yes. We now, feel that the Christ within each person is the way, the truth, and the life. But we're person. assuming what is to be proved. 
We have not proved that there is a Christ within every person. We have merely made a definition. We have arbitrarily split Jesus of Nazareth into two individual schizophrenic personalities. One is Jesus, a man, and the other is a Christ idea which indwelt him. But it's the testimony of the apostles. Matter of fact, let me go to Roman Catholic theology as my supreme proof here. Uh, you couldn't in prove Matthew, anything by that. Too. Well, I think I could historically. I mean, uh, this is fair to go historically to Catholic theology, and I would co- draw upon it. Uh, Matthew sixteen eighteen, the great passage which says, I say unto thee, thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Now Christ answered Peter. Now this is significant. Christ said to him, Blessed art thou, Simon, son of Jonah. For flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father which is in heaven. Then Peter said, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. Now in Greek you have three definite articles, each one emphasizing the Christ, the Son, the living God. Jesus is not a man indwelt by the Christ idea. Jesus is the Christ. You don't have any Christ idea within you, and I don't have any Christ idea within me. Either Jesus Christ dwells in you by faith, Or you are a Gnostic of the first century, simply trying to use Christian terminology in an attempt to uh, profess Christianity. And I don't think it'll work historically. Let me uh, just interrupt here for a moment to take care of some business. We're talking this morning with the Reverend Walter R. Martin. He is assistant professor of biblical studies at King's College, Briarcliff, New York. P.J. Sidney actor. Miss Gray, bookseller. (laughs) <laughs> and Roy Shatt, photographer. Anybody want to buy a bookstore for a low price, it'll be available in another two or three weeks. Ah, <laughs> uh, PJ. Well, I'm going to digress just for a moment. Uh, apparently, uh, there was some merit in uh, Miss Gray's objection to your using the word cult. It turns out that uh, one of the definitions... Uh, And this is a definition which, although perhaps by denotation may not be uh, the single one, but by connotation, I think she was right in her objection, there is one listed as uh, great devotion to some person, idea, or thing, especially such devotion viewed as an intellectual fad. And I think that that is the character which I, the use of the word at this period in history has. Jay was, is reading from the dictionary. I uh, should have made this one statement in conjunction with this, that um, writers such as Braden and um, Bach, whose theological uh, position is liberal, whereas mine would be conservative in uh, Christian theology, use exactly the same term, giving a definition in the preface as to exactly what they mean by this. I do the same in my books, and uh, I didn't define it, I guess, I suppose, because I assumed a priori that I was speaking in the context of non-Christian cult systems. Uh, I defined a non-Christian cult system as a group of people gathered around a specific person's interpretation of the Bible, claiming historic Christianity, but specifically denying doctrines of Christianity. This is a specialized definition for a specialized field of study. We've got to remember yeah. something, that in the United States, the field of cults has only come into consideration seriously by the Christian church in the last 15 years. And that up until that time of the you entire history... of 15? 15. 15. That's correct. As a matter of fact, when I started writing in the field and doing research on the subject, uh, I think a uh, study of my, my writings at this point would show that I have written more in the 10 years in the research area than had been written in the previous 75 years on the subject because it had lain dormant. That is, everybody was terribly afraid to say anything for fear everybody was going to be offended. Now, uh, I think we live in what might be called, if I quote the late President Kennedy on this in the Saturday Evening Post, he said, dare to think, to speak, to write. For when controversy dies, America dies. And this is the American controversial spirit. I'm awfully sorry that a lot of people were unaware of that statement because they certainly don't practice it in America. No, they certainly do not. They don't. And And when you enunciate controversy, as we're doing on controversial points, at least we're getting a hearing of what we think on the subject. People are listening to us and they're saying, well, this isn't put up. P.J. really doesn't agree with Walter. Roy doesn't agree with P.J. Eden doesn't agree with maybe the three of us. And John is sitting in the maybe deciding which <laughs> way he's going to go next, you see. But at least we're having a, a discourse. And I see nothing wrong with controversy if it's for the sake of exploration and knowledge. But if it's just for the sake 
of rearranging our prejudices, then we're wasting our time. We That's might well, just, well not have like controversy. That. Well, I don't think I don't think that that is what we're engaged in here. I hope not. I'm As not. a matter of fact, John, I must uh, make a confession here. I I talk behind your back, and. Uh, I suppose I might as well tell it now. You can stand on the corner later, but yeah. let's hear why. <laughs> Actually, I think that this program is probably the oasis in America. Amen. Where people can really say what they think without any regard for uh, uh, repercussions or, or anything else happening as a result. Uh, a great deal of obeisance is paid to free speech but uh, free speech usually means free speech if you believe what I believe. And uh, I have uh, had... Just a moment, PJ. Repercussions? Have you not read the telegrams or the hate mail that... Uh... That's not... Yeah, but this is not a repercussion. You see, a repercussion... Pressure, is, I think, is what you mean. Uh, what you, yes, pressure and effective pressure, yeah. which is to qualify it even further. I mean, you know, the pressure is one thing, but if the pressure has no effect, it doesn't mean anything. Uh, and, and I say to you, you know, that, that this is, is quite remarkable. Uh, and uh, I, keep, I keep being surprised on this program, actually, because I've had the very good fortune, as you notice, Reverend Martin, I, I'm a bit of a talker. And uh, I, used to bore, I used to bore people in living rooms. <laughs> and fortunately, I found a place, you know, where talking was uh, desirable. <laughs> so, you know, this is really a very happy combination. But uh, uh, actually, I've had the good luck to be on the show many times, and the the number of of uh, topics that have been discussed and have been discussed with a great deal of openness and freedom uh, uh, makes this, in my mind, and I, I I do a lot of thinking about this, a lot of reading about it, a lot of talking about it. A uh, real oasis of uh, free speech in America. Well, I agree with that because, you see, we live in what might be termed today, if I may uh, exercise this right of free speech, in what might be called an Emily Post era, uh, in which um, you can't say anything from the real sense of controversy, even an honest disagreement, without every pressure group and lobby on God's green earth trying to beat you over the head for either exploiting, discriminating, neglecting, rejecting, or trying to do something to see there's some minority group or uh, some uh, uh, group that is uh, trying to do a job. For instance, if you speak against the funeral uh, business, such as Jessica Mitford did, instantaneously you have uh, an orbit hole shot from the Undertaker's Association. This is all wrong and so forth. There's no point-by-point uh, hear... point refutation. It's I just... just did it last night. It's, oh, all, it's all wrong. Oh, John, you, you were wonderful last night. And um, uh, so far... Thank you, Eden. You are back, you are back <laughs> in his red race. Well, uh, uh, look, she knows... Inspiration house. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Blurring him up, buttering him up. Does she know how to use that? She well, certainly does. This is, she brought a pound of butter with her. <laughs> but this, uh, this whole point is this Emily Post idea is you can't offend, you can't say anything. Yeah. And if you criticize the thing, then immediately it's personal. Somebody says, well, you don't like me because you don't like my philosophy or my theology. Now, I don't agree with the theology of Gnosticism, and I don't know which cult you were speaking of before is one that you remember, Eden, but uh, my uh, concern for the perversion of Christianity under the name of Christianity does not mean that the people who hold a specific position necessarily have to be hated or that you've got to have an open war with them, you can't get along with them, you can't have uh, a relationship of rapport with them. I think this is absurd, and that's what we're getting today. It's getting to the place where it's almost un-American to disagree. And I think this is one of the great things that's getting to all of us today, and that's why I can say this, John, with no commercial, I may never get back again. And uh, Oh, you're I, already booked yeah. in four shows in my mind, right? <laughs> if, if that's the Lord's will, all right, but uh, let me honestly... But I've got uh, some rough ones coming no, up. No, it's all guys are really going to cut you to shreds. Well, they're, they're welcome. There's a lot of me. <laughs> this is, this but is I do think we have a chance to at least say something. This is only a warm-up period. You don't understand. Yeah, well, as long as it doesn't get too hot, I mean... I'm well, let me read a couple of telegrams here first. Uh, this is from John Martin. This is no r relation to uh, Reverend Martin. At least I don't think so. I don't think no. so either. I don't know. No, it's, it's a very crack. pleasant telegram. We know. Oh, sure, I'm sure of that. Yeah. But I don't think the fellow would, would uh, you know, come out with this. Reverend Martin is astonishingly brilliant. Well, a magnificent mind. Will Roy Shatt please keep his mouth shut for five or ten minutes? Better yet, send him out for sandwiches. He keeps interrupting P.J., who is also marvelous, signed John Martin. 
Well, John, many times I disagree with Shat, and, and, you know, this is kind of a thing we, you know, uh, we talk, and then maybe for two days we don't talk anything. I, I, I think you're wrong tonight, because I, I don't think that Roy has, has really interrupted at any time. Well, Roy has I think that Roy has, has had little opportunity tonight, and uh, this is not defending Roy. It's just the way I feel about it. Here's another one. Barbara Blakesley. If there is a supreme being, and if this being has given man a so-called free will, should this being be blamed for human fallacies or weaknesses along with being blamed for man-made religions from the beginning of time? Buddha, Jesus, Confucius, etc., were possibly great prophets of their times, but still were homo sapiens, not the supreme being. What about one universal religion based, I think they mean it's B-A-S-E-S, -E but it must mean based on the golden rule, signed Barbara Blakesley. Would you like to comment on that? Or? Well, I'll comment. I don't know whether anybody will agree with me, but at least I'll comment. First of all, there are two things, two points she's making. The first is free will. Mm -hmm. Now, free will and freedom naturally implies responsibility. Freedom is not license. We're free in the United States, but you're not free to go out and throw a brick through a window because if you do, your freedom has uh, become license and they're going to put you in jail for it. Now, when God gave man the capacity of response, when God made him free, when God created another will other than his own, he automatically had to do one of two things. Either it was a robot, and in such cases there is no responsibility, it's only a reflection of the creator, or there is freedom, and with freedom the risk of rebellion, which is exactly what took place. Now, if God chose, as the sovereign of the universe, to give man the capacity of freedom, and if man, as a free agent, makes a choice, there is no reason why God should be indicted for the consequences of man's freedom. And uh, this is what we're facing mm -hmm. today. People are blaming God for what they do. do you want actually, to they're free to do it. Do you want to comment on the telegram? Oh, yes, PJ? I certainly do. I certainly do. Uh, <clears throat> one of my... Uh, uh, one of the things that perplexes me constantly is that the religionists say that God created everything. He created people. He created the world. He created certainly the whole situation in which we find ourselves. And I find myself really confused at how any being all-knowing and all-powerful could create, let's say, anything like me. <laughs> That's a good beginning. <laughs> and and some, of my, some of my some of my detractors would like to stop there. <laughs> I think we should just go home now. Yeah, I think we should just go home. Stop that, CJ. <laughs> and put me into the difficulties in which I find myself, you know, besieged by these uh, you know, I got a comedy uh, setup going here. Uh, but seriously, that any being that was completely uh, omniscient, for instance, and omniscience would therefore mean to me that he could see into the future, that he would see all the pitfalls to which I would be subjected, and that such a being with all this knowledge, all this uh, uh, foreknowledge, <coughs> as a matter of fact, would make me as weak as I am and then would put me to a test. This has the characteristic of a sadist. Well, um, may I come in on this? Um, first of all, you made two statements. The whole situation in which we find ourselves, this is not God's doing. God created a world which was finitely perfect and gave man the capacity of choice. We plunged ourselves over the abyss. We are responsible for the conditions we find ourselves in by his permissive will. He allowed us to do it, otherwise we were robots. Are now, we not part of this world that he made? I, I, I firmly believe this, but uh, this is a, a very good point PJ's made, and I think we ought to answer it as he's made it. It's a, it's a very good point. The whole situation in which we find ourselves, if you want to use the existential situation in which we find ourselves right now, is not God's doing but ours, because it's a choice of man to direct his own future, and God has allowed him to do so, because we are free in that sense. Now, as far as creating you as weak as you are, if I can get this one point across, then I'll let you chop at me all you want. God primarily, when he created any will in the universe, knew automatically 
that the risk of rebellion existed, because if there's freedom, there's the choice of rebellion or of conformity. He was willing, knowing the choice of man, knowing all these things, to allow us to make our own choice because God desires that we love him. You can't love by compulsion. You love by volition. Nobody can compel you to love anybody because the moment they try to, it's no longer love. God wanted love and he wanted fellowship. And to do this, he had to have responsive moral agents with that capacity. I'm far, I have to get in here. I feel uh, that when you give... Let, let him finish. Can I finish, finish this first, one point? Please, I realize right. that there would be differences. Uh, <laughs> he didn't make you as weak as you are. You became that by your own sin. And uh, despite your sin, he still loves you. And I think that the Lord also has a very good sense of humor because to quote P.J., after you're, all, he made us. May I say <laughs> that you're, joking. You're, thinking in terms, you're thinking of God in terms of man. No, I'm you God in terms Will of you freedom, repeat what you all. said about love just a moment ago? Yes. Uh, to me, uh, at least so far as we're able to determine in the human relationship, love is not compulsive, it's volitional. If you compel somebody, if you put a gun to somebody's That's head and enough. say, yes. love me, yes. this is not love. Yes, but you see, you have the so-called omnipotent who is, is uh, giving us all these rules, really, along with giving us this world that you mentioned. And also giving us existence. Yes, but you see, I believe you're, ter you're talking in terms of man's ability to love other men and women well, and, and, we, and, and mankind. Yes, I would but have you're to speak anthropomorphically because I can't speak in the terminology of heaven when obviously I'm limited by the finite confines of earth. Well, I'm so distressed, Reverend Martin, about the way you are speaking about God. Do you, do you, do you well, I'm really sorry, I feel, shot you. Do you really feel God is an elderly gentleman with a nice long white beard on a cloud? No. Don't you feel that God is the creative principle, which is in and through every bit of his creation? Well, uh, I can answer this by saying this, that the creation cannot be greater than the creator. And well, certainly. But now, just a moment. You are a cognizant, reflective ego. You're sitting here talking to me in a subject-object relationship. You are a person, I and thou, to quote Martin Buber. We're together, right here, I and thou. That means that we are egos, we're personalities. Descartes said, because I think, therefore I am. All right, I am as an, ego, as an ego and you are as an ego. Now, if God, who created us, is principle, he is impersonal, and he is not ego. Therefore, the creation is greater than the creator, and this is rejected uh, a priori, immediately. Well, Nobody would accept this. Well, I don't understand uh, you. Would you uh, explain this uh, again, perhaps, in a simpler way for me? I'm sorry. Uh, 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 my point was this, that if God it, in what you're talking about is a principle. A principle is an a abstraction. A principle and a wisdom and an intelligence. But an abstraction, a, not a person. Not a person. No. Correct. Therefore, if not a person, not an ego. Because person implies personality and ego. Yeah. I don't know why you would say that as though you know it so absolutely. Well, I'm speaking the, in the context of uh, what our Lord's teaching is, and I am speaking from a Christian standpoint. I grant you this. Uh, you oh. see, if, if you take it from any other people who might be atheists, agnostics, Buddhists, etc., and Buddhists are atheists. And cultists. Granted, and cultists all around the world. You'll have a variety of people who will disagree with you. Just because you say it or your religion says it doesn't make it so. That is correct. And what we would have to do in order to prove this would be to show the highest probability of which view was correct in well, all the religions. Yes. If you have God and his creation, then you have duality, don't you? There is duality because you're sitting here talking to me. Your lips are moving. You're uh, verbalizing concepts which are being formed or have been formed in your mind but and above, stored. Above There's the a duality in you right the, now. Above the duality is the one. Isn't that so? Above the duality of flesh and spirit is the monotheism of the one eternal being, God. Yes. The girls who accept it. The great it. Well, I'm speaking now in terms of an accepted category. Right. Mm -hmm. If we're going to defend the concept of God's existence, now we're in a different plane. We can do that. I'm only speaking primarily but now in terms of this category. Uh, isn't this being in and through all his creation? No. That's pantheistic, that God is in everything and permeates creation. God is transcendent. He is apart from creation as creator, and he works through creation as redeemer. But he is not part of the stuff of creation. Otherwise, if well, we do that, no then he becomes part of the microphone, part of the That's table. That's right. Yes, yeah, sure. This is, this is I would assume and that then any there, is not, there is nothing to be redeemed because it is all God and all perfect. There's only one problem involved in this. That is, if everything is all God and everything is all good, where did the idea of 
evil, which is the opposite of God, originate? From an idea of separateness, a, a misunderstanding of separateness. Then you have to account for the origin of the idea. And, you know, I'd like to say something on this point. Uh, do you Can't share, stop you. Do you share <laughs> the view that God created everything? Now, either you do or you don't. By everything you mean the visible everything. universe, the man, world, every the atom world. that exists. Everything that exists, did God create it or didn't he All create? things were made by him, and without him was not anything made that was made. Fine. Right. Let's, and let's and start, let me go on. And when he looked at it, he saw it was good, didn't he? Big pardon? According to the Bible, it, he according said According to the Bible, when he looked at it, it was good it, until we got into the act. Just a moment, now, just a moment, just a moment, <laughs> just a moment. Now, you see, look, look, just a moment. Go ahead, PJ. God then created hell and Satan and the rest of it. No, God created hell. God created Lucifer, who became, by his own choice, the antagonist of deity. But it all grew out of God's doing, did it not? I, you know, it I all grew out of God's volitional choice. Yeah. And how could there God... Is how could God is there no, but how could God no, create... There is no Satan. Well, biblically, there is. No, but how could God create something imperfect? You see, here's the whole thing. There's nothing created imperfect. But but just a moment, everything. just a moment. There had to be a flaw. There had to be a basic flaw in Adam, so-called Adam. I don't believe this Adam and Eve mythology, but... If if I if I grant well, if you, you don't believe it, how can you use Adam as an example? Well, no, but I, I just to just. Oh, we can use it as an illustration. Uh, as an illustration. Oh, yes. As an well, illustration. Means. You say you say there was an Adam who fell from grace. Now, if if this is true, if God made Adam, God should have foreseen, and He should have made Adam of a stronger moral fiber than he was, quite evidently, to have fallen, as he did fall. Well, what you're really saying then, PJ, is if I were God, I would have done it differently. No, I'm not saying that. I'm saying, I'm getting around. Is that I'm, what you're really saying? No. God it, should have done it. If I were God, I would have done it that Would you way. like me to tell you what I'm saying? Uh, that's would what you like saying. Me? No, no, don't you tell me. Let me tell you what I'm saying. I'm saying to you that men created God. Now, how do you prove this? Men, God is a projection of men's minds. This is Feuerbach. Now, how do you prove it? But you see, he's being as dogmatic as you are. No, I said this. I said within the framework, now if you interpret me correctly, and if I haven't made myself clear, I will. I said within the framework of Christian theology. We're not discussing the proofs for the existence of God. You see, but each time you, you say this, however, you give us dogma, uh, dogma that we then must question. Well, I'm and willing to, 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 uh, to discuss dogma and question it and for free discussion, but what I'm pointing out here is this. Uh, P.J. says, and I'm quoting him now, I believe accurately, that... Uh, there must have been a flaw in Adam, because Adam, as an illustration, uh, fell from grace. Now, uh, if God were creating something perfect, then he wouldn't have created this the way he did it. There would have been a, a, a fiber of, um, uh, a no fiber of imperfection. There wouldn't have been any of these conditions. It would have been a perfect thing. But what actually is being said, and this is a very subtle thing, although we don't like to admit it, P.J. is really saying, in essence, if I were God... I would do it this way. That is not what I'm no, saying. Don't Please don't is. interpret for me. Look, 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 look. <laughs> let me tell you, look. I use English yeah. fairly well, you know? And if I meant that, I would have said that. That is not what I'm saying at all. But I am merely going along with the, with the postulate that there is this God that made the atom. I don't even believe it, don't you see? Mm, yes, I know. You see. So I'm saying to you, however, that taking your postulate I go on from there and I say that if this God this all knowing this all powerful all perceiving in the future all foreseeing God were to make an imperfect vessel and then charge this vessel this imperfect vessel with sin or with some dereliction because this imperfect vessel behaved imperfectly this doesn't it's make. unfair, and I agree. But, may, I, may I make a statement here? God did not make imperfection in Adam. We're assuming imperfection in order to attack God's creation. Well, how could he have done an imperfect thing if he was, if he was perfect? He did. All right. You remember the God mist said that fell over? God said thou wast perfect of Satan until iniquity was found within thee. Where did the iniquity come I'm, from? God I'm made I'm everything. Try, I'm trying to get to this one point. Yes. Uh, according to the best information we have, biblically speaking, the cause for evil was the rebellion of a free will by its choice against its creator. Where did they get the free will? God invested man and angels with the capacity to either, re let me finish, I'm sorry. to either respond to his love or reject his love. Now, if they chose to reject his love, this, of course, would be sin. But it would be a free choice. But he gave, if he gave them the choice of accepting or denying anything, yes. he also suggested with this action that... Uh, 
should you... Whatever you do is all right. Whatever you do is still from me since I made you. No, not necessarily. Not necessarily God very is strange infinite. term. God yeah. is infinite and man is finite. If God created man infinitely perfect, then man would be God. I think you're rationalizing the point. I think you're saying that because it fits the argument. Well, but I, I, I think don't over the years, over the years, people have argued this way because they had wanted to explain away certain things which they could not well, explain. I, I, I can't explain away it. I quite agree with you, as does C.S. Lewis and quite a few Christian theologians, that the problem of evil itself has inadequate data for an absolute pronouncement. Thank you very much. I'm only pointing out that there are alternative propositions to saying God's responsible. That's all. Let me just interrupt here for a moment to take care of some business. And now, back with our guests of the morning. <clears throat> if I may for just a moment, well, first let me reintroduce our guest. Reverend Walter R. Martin, Assistant Professor of Biblical Studies at King's College, Briarcliff, New York, is our guest of the morning. And uh, we've invited P.J. Sidney, actor, Eden Gray of Inspiration House, the bookstore, and uh, Roy Shatt, photographer. If I may digress for just a moment, I have talked many times with rabbis, and we've had some pretty hot hassles here by having an orthodox, a, a reform, and, con and conservative rabbis on at the same time. And I hope that no one is offended. This is not being critical, but just a little bit of knowledge that I acquired, and maybe everybody in the world knows it, but I didn't. You know, you talk in terms of, uh, of uh, kosher things, you know, foods and things like that, and kosher slaughtering methods and what have you. Did you know that a rabbi must wear kosher clothes? No, I'd never heard that. And do you know, I, I don't know how you pronounce this, is it shotness? S-H-A-T-N-E-S? Shotness, I think shotness. so. Yes. Shotness test by the Shotness Laboratory, and presumably if you're a rabbi, you would not wear the garment unless it had this seal on it. And when you have this seal, there's a little wire and an extra little seal that this is clamped on, and this means that the garment that is made for you has been approved. And in other words, you cannot have wool and linen you could not use a linen thread if you're sewing a wool fabric. For some reason, there is something that would be non-kosher about this. I thought it's interesting. Well, can you is that anything like samurai? Can, can a rabbi wear a linen shirt <laughs> uh, with a wool suit? That's an interesting thing. Or I don't would he know. Ha would it have See, to be right a away, I give a little piece of information and you become hungry for knowledge. I'm not going to give it all away tonight. You'll have to tune in again at a later night and we'll give you the rest of I thought this is interesting. You know where I found this out? I went down to Mr. Tony's, you know, the sponsors, the mm -hmm. custom tailor, and they've been sponsors for some time. And I was down there talking with uh, Milton and, uh, and Mr. Tony. And there was a rabbi there. And... Uh, a few weeks ago, I was down there. There were two rabbis and two priests that were buying clerical garb down there. But this rabbi asked something about the label. And I couldn't figure what he wanted. Then it dawned on me, evidently, he didn't want the name of the company in his garment. For what reason, I don't know. And I thought he was trying to tell Mr. Tony not to put the Mr. Tony label in, which, for some reason which I wouldn't understand, would, would be, certainly be his right anyway. And uh, so they, they made a deal about this, and the garment has to be sent. So I got involved in it myself, and I found out that the garment, when it's completed, is sent to the Shopness Laboratory. And they, in turn, test, using some method to find out whether there's any linen, if it's a wool garment, used. And then they give the seal... Uh, it's located out in Brooklyn, and uh, Evergreen 78520, and they've got a, a microscope on here, and they evidently use that microscope, and then it says here, non-shotness, tested by the shotness laboratory of such and such Avenue, Brooklyn, guaranteed only if label is attached by this seal. In other words, the label can't even be stitched to the garment. 
They have this little wire to hold the label on, and that becomes a seal. And it's the N.S. Shotness Laboratory. That's I would have the a end of the question seal. about the wire being metal. And well, no, I'm, I'm sorry. I shouldn't so say it's wire. Maybe no, it's it's I, with I, some I, other material. I, I, wonder, I just know. wonder about it. I don't All know. those things would... <laughs> but I know this is attached it. separately, but not the, the label is not stitched yes, I see. to the garment. Mm -hmm. Little bits of information that you gather on the Long John Neville Show. And tomorrow night at this time, I'll be telling <laughs> you how to make three-minute soft-boiled eggs in two minutes. <laughs> I'd right, say so you people, I mean, you want to sit back, but I, tomorrow you'll be talking all over town, giving this little bit out as if you yes, discovered it yourself, right. say. You sit back, relaxed as if this is a nothing. All right, let's get to the telegram. John's show is a success. Can't list for top rating. Signed, Bobby. This did not come in after this shotness thing. <laughs> <laughs> he, may, he may want to revise that's that. That's right, that's right. Bobby, you want your money back? <laughs> Here's another one. What is this nonsense of excesses attributed to Moses and Joshua and their condoning the killing of children for religious purposes? Morris H. Finer sends this. I believe that I stated before that there are those who charge Judaism with excesses and they charge Moses and Joshua. No, you said in the time, in their in time. In that particular uh, time. Not that Moses did it. I, no, I, I didn't you. say that. I don't agree that Moses or Joshua did this uh, as an excess. I believe that whatever judgments God dictated in the Old Testament for reasons uh, known to himself are uh, his own business and mm -hmm. I'm willing to, as I think anybody should, be willing to concede what his judgments are. But uh, there are those who do maintain that uh, such as the extinction of the Canaanites was a barbaric thing. And uh, I pointed out that uh, just because some people state this doesn't necessarily mean that you have to believe Judaism is barbaric. That's all. Right. I have this to say, that even here is illustrated quite clearly that if you had five people watching a scene, you're going to have five different stories about that scene. There's no doubt about it. We've proven it with a game that is called the, uh, I think, uh, ten people, one of them reads the typewritten piece of paper and whispers it one to the other. Jack and Barbie. by the time the end of the thing, as you must have heard, uh, in one evening, there is a complete difference. The last man speaks it out loud, and it's nothing like the sheet of paper that uh, was originally written. Now, I have this to say. In many, many thousands of years... Let's say a couple of thousand years, just a couple of thousand years, things were bound to have been misunderstood, revised, particularly since uh, real uh, reading started after Gutenberg in 1440. He was the guy who printed, uh, invented printing with movable type. And his first uh, bit of printing was the Bible. And as a matter of fact, uh, I think it was something like 89% or more of the people of the world were illiterate and had to be read to and read for and written for to their, to their different people. So that most of this was uh, done by uh, talk, talking from one to the other. So that these stories were revised and revised and even the written stories that could be read were revised because each person had a point of view. <clears throat> well, um, if you're going to apply this to the transmission of the Old Testament, which I assume this is what you're saying. I'm saying my correct. Well, yes, I I'm, going, I'm going beyond that when he finishes. Uh, okay, mm -hmm. uh, may I bring this point out? Mm -hmm. uh, of course, this is a problem of what is called textual criticism and the study of transmission of manuscripts. Yes. But it is a quite a significant thing, I think, that we ought to take into consideration that in the study of the manuscripts of the Old Testament, yes. for instance, the Isaiah manuscript, which we just found in the Dead Sea Scrolls, which is dated 150 which to 200 I want to talk BC. About next. Yeah. Now, you bring that scroll in, and let's say from 150 B.C. to 1964, right? That's better than 2,000 years. Now, you would expect to find, on the basis of what you were just saying, yes. enormous discrepancies in a book as large as Isaiah. It's a large book. Yet, the scholars who translated this commented on the fantastic accuracy of the Isaiah manuscript to the manuscripts we possess today, some in the 13th century and some up to the present moment, and it was Dr. William F. Albright who, is, uh, who was and is considered the greatest archaeologist alive. He's on the faculty of Johns Hopkins University. His book, From a Stone Age to Christianity, is the classic in the field. Dr. Albright has never been a friend of historic Judaism or Christianity, so he's an unbiased source from that standpoint. Dr. Albright says, after studying the archaeological remains of the Old Testament, there is no doubt that it is the most fantastically accurate thing that has ever been confirmed by archaeology. But I'd like to say now, this. I, I've got to bring this point out because I think it's important. The actual transmission of Old Testament manuscripts, according to the best Hebrew scholars, 
is the most accurate of any world's religion, and not only the most accurate, but has so little transcriptional error that it's almost fantastic. The New Testament, which is also a document almost 2,000 years old, has been validated from four major manuscripts and literally thousands of fragments found in different places by different groups so they could hardly be accused of collusion. When they're all brought together and studied, they tell essentially the same story with uh, minute variation. Not minute. Uh, let me finish Quite what I'm saying. Big changes. Let me finish what I'm saying. Now, uh, when I say minute, uh, I mean minute, and I would welcome any enormous changes that you might adduce at this point, because uh, Dr. Um, I believe it is uh, Bruce Metzger of Princeton University, has stated that we have 97% of the New Testament right at the present moment, probably from the tracing the manuscripts back. And its accuracy is beyond all dreamed reconstruction, which I think is fairly good evidence for accuracy of the Bible. I'm well, then, sorry. Why We're do going they to keep on making new translations? Could well, this is the result of finding manuscripts which shed a little finer light on one passage. For instance, if you come across... Um, uh, a passage where uh, a word has been, uh, through the centuries, uh, construed one way. Then you get a, an older manuscript where this particular word is given in context a sharper meaning. You don't, you don't change the passage, but you can certainly give a tremendous impact to the passage with this additional information. Now, the New Testament itself and the Old Testament, I would stand 100% behind the statement of both Jewish scholars and Christian scholars. These are the most accurate of all manuscripts of any religions in the world. Fantastically accurate. Let me interrupt for a moment. We're going to take a break at this time. Good morning. We do have guests. We have... Uh Reverend Walter R. Martin. Reverend Martin is Assistant Professor of Biblical Studies at the King's College in Briarcliff, New York. He's a recording artist with the Audio Bible Society of America, as well as an author and lecturer. We've invited Roy Shatt, photographer, to be with us. Eden Gray of Inspiration House, the bookstore that's located on West 56th Street, 129 West 56th Street. And uh, P.J. Sidney, actor. My name, Long John Neville. We have a couple of telegrams here. Long John, thanks for the good program tonight. Mr. Martin's explanation of Christianity was so clear and informative. He's great. Have him on again. Roy Carley, C-A-R-L-E-Y, of Bridgeport, Connecticut. Here's another one from Pat Bryant of New York. Have you forgotten about Edgar Cayce's principle of free will? All right, that uh, we have... Uh, I wonder what Edgar yes, Cayce's oh, principle of free will is. Does anybody know? See, I, I considered myself to be almost an authority on Edgar Casey about seven or eight years ago when I was handling it almost every week. And, you know, you begin, I, forget, I don't even know Did if he's know faced he, in the East, the West, or what anymore. Did you know that Hugh Lynn had written a new book about his father? No, if it did, it's little interest to me if Hugh Lynn didn't use brains enough to send it to me. A nice big book done by Harper's called Venture Inward. No, that's, that's Hugh's fault, not mine. That's his loss. I have had, I remember... When I lived over in Tudor City, that when Hugh came up, this is Hugh Lynn Casey I'm referring to, the son of the late Edgar Casey, the sleeping doctor. One night, uh, I should say one evening, about 10 o'clock, Hugh came up to my apartment, and I was going to do a half-hour show with him. I was doing half-hour shows in those days. And four quarts of ginger ale, and I'm not kidding because I'm not a drinking man, and he doesn't drink at all. I may have a cocktail sometime. Four quarts of ginger ale later, about 4.30 in the morning, we were still talking. And then it dawned on me, say, we better do a show. <laughs> and we put on the tape and did a half-hour show. But I assure you, the four hours were great. The things that he told me about his father. And uh, I'm kind of amazed that Hugh Lynn didn't uh, see fit to get a book to me. But uh, as I say, that's, uh, that's up to uh, Mr. Casey. We... Uh, 
We have just a minute or two before we break, so... Uh, Maybe we'd better do the uh, stuff. You think we'll do the break right away? And then... Uh... All righty. Right. And uh, you might pick it up from there. That is, I think I would certainly uh, not rephrase the question, but I think I would ask the question again. I would like to ask a question. <clears throat> something that you asked over an hour ago. And uh, it was something that you had said about the Dead Sea Scrolls. Yes. And you seem to have quoted from the Dead Sea Scrolls. And I think you uh, stated that this quotation from the Dead Sea Scrolls described Jesus Christ's coming. No, I didn't say that. I was, referring to, the, I was referring to the Isaiah manuscript, yes. which was in part of the finds of the Qumran community, I believe. And uh, this manuscript, dated reliably about 150 to 200 B.C., yes. is the manuscript of the prophet Isaiah, which, is a mess which in many areas is messianic, that is, pointed forward to the coming of the Messiah. And I said that it was remarkable for its congruency and consistency with our manuscripts today, many centuries later, mm -hmm. which pointed up its accuracy. This is what I said. But you say you suggest it suggested to me, and perhaps it did to uh, others, I don't know, that uh, since what you had said before that uh, indicated that these words were so marvelously prophetic that they were pro prophesying the coming of Jesus Christ, all the Messiah. Uh, the, the prophecy, what I meant, uh, I thought I clearly stated it, but what I meant is this, that the prophecies of the Old Testament concerning the coming of the Messiah. Yes. Are quite a number of them, as you well know. And uh, though uh, the Christians, theologians, and Jewish theologians differ quite markedly yes, on what they, they think yes, of they these do. passages, nevertheless, in Christian theology, uh, Isaiah uh, chapter 53, the uh, concept of the suffering servant uh, is a messianic passage and was so considered by rabbinical scholars uh, before the time of Christ. And all I stated was that this has a remarkable prophetic utterance concerning the Lord Jesus Christ as we understand it. There are at least, I believe, 14 specific points there that Christ fulfilled each one of these 14 points. And no one else has ever fulfilled these things. Mm -hmm. As a matter of now, fact, it's, it's striking fulfillment. May I say that uh, when you, you say... Do you think he did them just to fulfill the prophecies? Well, if he did, he would or have had to... Uh, if he did, he would have had to do things that were beyond his own power to do. That is, he would have had to plan things before he was born. He would have had to live up to each detail and then arranged gratuitously to be crucified as an offering. Uh, he would have had to arrange uh, uh, at just the right moment to cry out, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani, my God, my God. Why this was stated that he would do that? Oh, in the, in the 22nd Psalm, which is a Psalm of David, which Christ quoted on the cross, David is speaking and David says, my enemies have circled me about, uh, I'm alone, I'm abandoned and so forth. And Christ is the son of David and he was of David's line through Joseph and Mary. Well, cried through out, Joseph, then, that, then he isn't the son of God, is he? I'd like to go, when will you get through with this, I'd like to go into that. Well, Joseph was his earthly father, but uh, the Holy Spirit was, his, uh, uh, was the agency of his conception, God, the Holy Spirit. Joseph was his earthly father? Yeah, it doesn't the, sound very Christian to me. I thought it was an immaculate conception and that God was his father. Well, let us put it this way. God was his father and Joseph was the earthly custodian of our Lord. Well, then, he couldn't, then, he, no, then he couldn't possibly have inherited from the line of David. Why? Well, I mean, if, if, he was, if Jesus was born of a virgin. He was and Joseph had nothing to do with his mother, then he cannot have been born through Joseph of the line of David. Well, that's you see, just uh, common sense. No, uh, there's one thing that's been left out. The lineage of Mary is also given, and she is of the lineage of David, going right back to David and Bathsheba. So his earthly mother would account yes, for his one, Davidic lineage. Yes, but what the, uh, the uh, gospel, I forget which one it was, that speaks about that, speaks about it through David, uh, through Joseph. Matthew speaks of it through Joseph and Luke through Mary. If you check both genealogies, you'll find that they're one of Mary and one of Joseph. So through either lineage, he would be the son of David, and uh, he would be uh, the Messiah, according to the Christian faith. And of course, we believe this is biblical prophecy is fulfilled. I'd rather not get into this, but I'd like to continue my, uh, I'm supposed to be the, this sort of round table thing, and maybe I can do it. Pardon me, Eden, may I get back to I'm it? quite finished with that. Yes. I just wanted uh, to catch him up on it. I'd like to get to something else. I, as I understand it, correct me if I'm wrong. If 
the teachings of Jesus Christ uh, have come to us as they have come to us in their varying ways, one of the things that we've learnt is that Christ is supposed to have said that if you have something to say to the people, go to them. Do not build a house and have them come to you. Have you heard this? No, I know of no quotation in the New Testament or the, uh, in the New Testament to this effect. You, you don't know of none? I know of none in the New Testament to this effect. If you well, do, I should be delighted to see well, it. I have heard it. No, I uh, cannot yeah. show it to you. Yeah. That's why I say uh, if, if I'm right. I've no, heard he this several this. times. He didn't say this. Uh, what he did uh, say, I don't know, this comes close to some of the language you're using, but right. doesn't you have any, put it, in your it doesn't have any relevancy actually to what you're saying. It says this, that Christ says if you have something against your brother, then before you go into the temple to make a sacrifice, first go to your brother and straighten it out with him and then make your no, sacrifice. No, this is a different thing. This entirely. is entirely different, entirely but that's the only different. thing that I know of that would even approximate it. Mm. Well, the argument as I got it, or the statement, I, sh I, I can't pursue that because if I, I, I may be wrong. I, I know of no statement way. to that effect. All right. Uh, the, uh, you stated that what did to you claim that was in the Bible? No, I didn't say oh, that. Did no, I, 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 just, I didn't know where it was. I just had heard it, and I wanted to know if it was true, and if he could uh, give me a quotation that could back it up. And he could not, and so I don't know if it is true. All right? And to go on, uh, you say that to be a good Christian, you must follow Jesus Christ and his doctrine. I believe that's the, that was your quote. Uh, I said, you said, yes, I also said you, Christianity is first and foremost faith in the Lord Jesus Christ as a person, as a yes. personal savior, and naturally his doctrine and his ethics would follow from this. When you, your words, and I quoted them at the moment of your saying it, where you follow Jesus Christ and his doctrine. Yes, and the doctrine, of course, of Christ is his own testimony that he is the son of God. Now, the, the Christ's testimony comes to us through a variety of ways. Uh, do you believe, or is, uh, those who do not believe, call, call it do a dogma? I think you know this. Yes. And uh, those of us who do not believe in dogma would like to pursue and uh, would like to uh, question these dogmatic remarks simply because someone says it happened doesn't necessarily mean that it did happen. Uh, do we really know Jesus Christ's doctrine? Well, let's put it this way. The New Testament is prima facie evidence of the teachings of Christ. There, it was recorded by his apostles and commented on as early as the first century and the second century by the church fathers and up through the fifth century, the whole consistency of the pattern of his teaching is very clear. As a matter of fact, if you... We disagree, you know. If you I didn't told even, you this before. Yeah, even if you didn't have the New Testament, the first five centuries of the church fathers would give you the entire New Testament almost quoted verbatim. Can you tell me where these books or writings can be found? Yes, uh, you can find the writings in the Antonicene and Nicene Fathers, which is in most public libraries, translated from the Latin Church Fathers and the Greek Church Fathers, uh -huh. uh, starting in the second century with uh, uh, Origen Contra Celsus and going through Clement and uh, Polycarp. And uh, you would find uh, also very strong evidence in Tertullian, Chrysostom, well, it's so enough. You've got You've named a lot of people. Therefore, my next question which goes off something that I said about an hour ago about Gutenberg. I say that in 1440, which is 1440 years after the birth of Christ, mm -hmm. uh, the Bible was finally given to the people to read, and it took them a long time to, to learn to read because, as we all agreed, the, most of the people were not educated. They had to be read to and, and written for. 1440, and in that Bible, there was a suggestion, which you may in, in, uh, disagree with, that the earth was flat. In the Bible? Yes. Now, where would this Gutenberg's be found? Gutenberg's Bible. Where would this be found? In Gutenberg's Bible. In the text or in a, a marginal commentary? In an illustration of that. In, in the, the woodcuts. In, in, in illustration. In wood the woodcuts. Well, that is, that is the opinion of uh, a person who draws a picture based on his interpretation of the Bible. They did not, however, Bible, say the earth was round. The Bible does not say that the earth is flat. Or round. Uh, it does in the book of Job, which is allegedly the oldest book, where it says that the Lord sits upon the circle of the earth. Oh, well, the I circle trust can... that, Roy, you're not going to give out misinformation and try to lead people who don't have a knowledge of the shape of the earth that it's round. 
Let's stick to I the facts now, man. It's flat. Like we it. all know it. <laughs> you walk out in the street and you'll see it. But if, you know, if you want a joking kid for a little while, fine. But straight John, out, you're absolutely right. I right. I want empirically to verify it. Right, right. <laughs> I want you to give me that quotation again about the circle, please. Yes, it's from the book of Job. Uh, the quotation I could check up for you if you please. wanted me to. The word circle. Uh, as it would it be is. that uh, uh, the Lord sits upon the circle of the earth. I believe fine. that's a quotation. A circle could be on a flat surface, could it not? Assuming you were looking down at it. Fine. A circle is not a uh, an orb. Well, I don't know. I understand oh, no, that... no, I think I, that's pretty clear. I, all I know is that from geometry that uh, uh, circumference of a circle is 2 pi r, and then when I took plane geometry, this was... Uh, uh, circular, and we would call it an orb, wouldn't we? No, 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 wait, Never. now, you've really gotten mixed up. Now, as a matter of fact, you, you, you've gotten into, uh, you've gone from plane geometry, <laughs> yes. uh, which which would be the circle, <laughs> mm -hmm. to, uh, uh, what's, the, what's the other geometry? Uh, where, where you take solid. A, uh, solid geometry, where you take it in three dimensions. Mm -hmm. So, uh, uh, but uh, on the basis of plane geometry, certainly, within this room, I can walk around in a circle. And, 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 and just a moment, and you will be able to perceive it as a circle without being able to be above it looking down on it. You will be able to look at it from your vantage point here and see that I'm walking in a circle. I don't, I don't, I don't agree with that, and I think you're stretching it. And I think, I'm not I, I think you're anything. No, I have to finish what I have to say yeah, about it. As far as I'm concerned, it makes no difference to me whether a Bible writer thought it was flat or round. If God says, then if I've God got problems. Said, you see. If God said it, I have problems, but God did not say it. You well, you see, when you say God said anything, you are then saying that uh, you have a quotation from him. I oh. now would like you to show me in your Bible where there's a quotation from him. Quotation from God? From God, oh yes. Oh, well, this is, this is very easy. Uh, Exodus chapter 20, uh, beginning with the first verse. I am the Lord thy God, who have brought thee out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. Thou shalt have no other gods Now, here we have dogma. Let me again, finish now. Right? Let me finish. You want a statement from God? I'm sorry you asked Jewish, for that, Roy. According to Jewish <laughs> theology. Yes. Uh, and you're Jewish, although you may not pursue the Torah itself. But according to Jewish theology, the scripture says, I am the Lord thy God that brought thee out of the land of Egypt. This is the Exodus. Out of the house of bondage, thou shalt have no other gods before me. Thou shalt not make unto thee any graven image or any likeness of anything in heaven above the earth, below or the waters under now the earth. Now that this, these words That's are written... That's a statement written, from just, God. Just a moment. Now that these words are written in a book, who put them there? They were transcribed, those words, by Moses. Transcribed from where? And this is something we... No, the Lord communicated to Moses. Well, we, we've gone into this before. Uh, uh, sure. Uh, yes, and... Uh, uh, you may have certain proofs from your Dead Sea Scrolls. No, I, I'm not adducing those as proofs of that statement. No, I understand it. But I, 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 you may have some proofs from wherever. However, I have not heard any proofs or seen any proofs or uh, uh, been apprised of any proofs that actually these men got these messages. Uh... At, a, at an earlier time, we had a gentleman on the show, and he kept referring to, well, it's written in Scripture. And, of course, Scripture, the, the word Scripture means it's written. And, of course, we get back again to the problem of by whom. And I, Roy touched on something earlier uh, about the matter of the, the, the passage of things down through history. And although you may find a great similarity between some of the new unearthings and the, uh, what's been in the books for a very long time, still the interpretations down through the years have altered a great many of these meanings. And Which interpretations do you refer to? Certainly the interpretations within the practice of the religion itself. And but not the text. <laughs> Uh, uh, no. The text in many ways, yes. The, the text, too, actually. We've yet to, from, cite, we've yet in, to cite evidence. Oh, well, look, look, oh, look. If, if, we had chosen, if we had chosen to, to bring different, uh, because uh, Miss Gray uh, uh, earlier spoke about the translations, the various translations, the, the very many translations that there are, and these translations do vary. These translations are not identical, otherwise there wouldn't be different translations. Uh, but there are some problems, you see, uh, it seems to me that... We can that, see that. Yes, yes, there, there are some very definite problems, and I think if, if we specify what the problems are, uh, one of the main problems is that you are a believer, and I am not a believer. Maybe he doesn't feel uh, that's a problem. Uh, well, it is a believer, it is a problem if in talking with non-believers, in the sense that he starts out with certain 
assumptions. That's the point. And uh, what I discover very frequently in talking with believers is that they have a tremendous sense of disappointment uh, that you don't uh, give the same kind of weight to their assumptions that they give to their assumptions. Now, the, what I grant is his right to hold his assumptions for his own sake and for his own purposes and for the direction of his life. You will grant, of course, that you make the opposite assumptions. Oh, precisely. Then we're both on the same ground. But you have to discuss yes, it with yes, us. Yes, but you see... Well, I'm perfectly willing to discuss you, but, it. But you, but you see, once, once the discussion has the character, you see, of your feeling that your assumptions, for whatever law they may be to you and in your life, they are not law... They do not represent any points of reference in our discussion unless you were discussing this with somebody who holds the same view as you. And I think that many of these attempts at discussion bog down uh, because uh, if one of the discussants is, is a believer, uh, he makes certain assumptions and then there's a, always a sense of disappointment, a kind of injured innocence really, at the fact that we don't, uh, or some of us, those of us who don't believe, uh, uh, cannot accept that this is gospel, you see. Oh, because well, look, gospel be doesn't mean the same thing I'll be to perfectly us. frank with you. You're being frank with me. I'll be perfectly frank. Yeah, I'm you mean you haven't been frank up to no, now? No, but I want to be as frank as I can, you see. <laughs> oh, see, there's, 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 I've been, I've been see, taken. There's, there's, uh, there's another <laughs> assumption. <laughs> I think I'll go home. Uh, well, don't do that because uh, we miss you terribly. The point I'm trying to bring out, to be perfectly honest about it, is this. That to be perfectly we may, honest, we may, I knew we kept him here long enough. He'd be honest. Come <laughs> clean. <laughs> you see, this is what happens. The moment you make a statement, you presuppose the antecedent of it, which is you weren't honest up to that point. It's like saying, "Do you still beat your wife, John?" Yes. Exactly. Now that's, answer it one way or the other. Well, you can't. You well, say. that's the question. But, but that's what you said to me. You see. So let me get to this point, anyhow. Uh, I'm not either wounded, upset, or disturbed by the fact that you won't grant an assumption as to a biblical authority. All I'm saying is that we are discussing within a specific framework Christian theology. Now, I have to answer within that specific framework. If you want to discuss the validity of documents, if you want to discuss evidence for their truthfulness, if you want to discuss assumptions preconceptions, premises, fine. Let's discuss it on that basis. Well, but, that's what I've been but, talking but, about but, all the time. <laughs> what we're trying to do is talk in the context of Christian theology. That's what I've been asked. Yes. Now, if you want to go into the realm of philosophy, fine, let's do that. That's something entirely No, but different. I'd like to answer your question. I'm going to give you the simplest argument that most people know. You asked about change. I want to show you that things have changed from this little uh, proof that uh, people who discuss the Bible have. And I think you, you will go along with me on this. Adam and Eve. God made Adam and Eve. That's two people on the earth. Mm -hmm. Adam and Eve had two children, Cain and Abel. That's mm -hmm. four people on the earth. Mm -hmm. Cain killed Abel. That's three people left. Mm -hmm. Then it says Cain went away and married somebody. Mm -hmm. Please. People then say, we then say, who did he marry since there's only three on earth? This is a pretty obvious argument. Yeah, may I answer it? I understand, but this answer has been given in a variety of well, ways. Let's, 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 let's well, I'd like, like to give the answer, if I may. First of all, you are not taking into consideration intervals of time between the multiplication of Adam and Eve. There were many years because Adam lived to be very old and they had many children. The Bible doesn't categorize this. It simply says Adam and Eve and gives you the basic outline, Cain and Abel and right down the line. There were many children in the interval creation period. It does period. not say this in the Bible. I'm well, sorry. If you know your Bible, you'll I, find I think out. I know it pretty well. This is the point I'm bringing out. If you go two chapters further, you'll find the genealogy, genealogy of Adam and Eve and you'll see all the children mentioned right in there. So obviously they came as a result of the union. Would you then therefore say the brother married sister Obviously. that was true? Obviously. I see. Well, well, I did, this I, was just a folk tale anyway. It wasn't supposed to be any more than I, an just, allegory just, of just the, in case we of get, the uh, beginning of the Bible. Well, we got the, just in case we get confused on a point, let me say this. That a brother marrying sister at the beginning of the race is quite different than today because if you had your choice of drinking water from the Hudson River, I think you'd much rather drink... I uh, think you're the, being the, terribly the funny right now. down here at the battery. No, I think you're making a story. funny out of what we're... we're I think we're talking seriously now. You this know is what? a serious I point. I don't think it's serious when somebody says that this is a folk tale and a myth. 
That's well, not that's serious. Well, I'm, joke too. I no, didn't no, say I it. No, no, I beg your pardon. Uh, and you agree? Uh, no, uh, Reverend Martin. Let, pardon me, let Edith <laughs> in on this. No, Even Reverend Gray. Martin, there have been many, many... I mean, this is not my own thought at all, but there have been many, many books written about the Bible, explaining the Bible, discussing the Bible, and mm-hmm. certainly the myth of Adam and Eve. Uh, the Bible has been... In other words, the Bible has been divided into history, as you know, into plays. I think you uh, agree that Job was never supposed to be a true story uh, any more than uh, the story of uh, who, Jonah and the whale. Well, I wouldn't agree but, with this. I uh, believe their history. No, well, you're just being a fundamentalist now. Was that but, a dirty word? Yes. Well, well we've got the That's crit- interesting. Now, that, that, John, can I make a point here on this? Oh, this is very oh, interesting now. Uh, now I'm a fundamentalist. Well, it, now, just a moment. Well, be, because I believe in Adam and Eve. Oh, now, certainly. Bishop Sheen believes in Adam and Eve. I'll bet so he doesn't even get him alone. Just a moment. Now, let me finish. I'm trying to bring an important point out. Nobody in their right mind attaches the, and it's a slur in this context, fundamentalism to Bishop Sheen, to the hierarchy of the Roman Catholic Church, to the hierarchy of established large denominations who affirm the same thing, or to any individuals of prestige and power who affirm these things. Instead, fundamentalism is used as a tag to put on anybody who believes in the historical validity of the Old Testament documents. If it's true in your case, it would be true in all. Uh, Uh, And I think it's only fair to say that fundamentalism, according to the history of the Christian Church, was the faith of the Church Fathers all the way through the Reformation and up to the present day. And if you're going to just say that that I'm a fundamentalist because I believe this, then go and indict Augustine and Aquinas and Scotus and Luther and Calvin and Zwingli and Knox. Don't pick on me. Pick on them. You've got big guns to play with there. I'm just a small potato. Uh, <laughs> Reverend Martin, isn't it true that the Bible was folklore and, as I said before, poetry and no, history it is not true, as far and as all the rest of it? Well, there have been many books written on this subject. Well, well there are many books written on the subject of defining well dialectical materialism it. as a philosophy, but it's false. And, and this, the uh, myth of a- uh, Adam and Eve uh, was uh, not original with the Jews. They picked it up from uh, the Sumerians, didn't they? No, they did not. Well, that's what I read in my history book. Which history book are you reading? <laughs> No, you're John, reading the Babylonian myth construction of Genesis, you'll find it there, but you won't find it in Jewish theology. John, we got the religionists fighting among themselves. Yeah, let's, I was let's wondering retire, about this. Let's retire. Oh, you know what amuses me is our brother here says religionist. Now, here's another tag. If you hold a religious viewpoint or a theological viewpoint, automatically you become per se a religionist. Is that a dirty word? Well, it's a, the way it's used in most publications today, a religionist is a person who just accepts some form of religion. I am a theist. Which I is quite different than a religionist. I agree with that difference. You see, if you said to a Jewish Orthodox rabbi, you're a religionist, he would turn around and say, Hero <laughs> here, Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. I am a theist and I believe in one God, and he would give you his theology. But he's also a religionist. If you believe it in another context, you're not the way he would mi- No, I'm not using it as a dirty word. I don't think exactly. Exactly. Uh, <laughs> I'm glad you put that in there. That reveals the multitude. A soil is blurry, not just dirty, no. just soil. Thank you, John, for the qualification. No, no, no. Oh, some of my best friends, but, you know. <laughs> uh, keep going. This is marvelous. <laughs> you said something. He's a good audience, isn't he? Yeah. You said, uh, <laughs> use the phrase, Christian interpretation. Uh, I consider this a dirty word. Well, I suppose you would, but the uh, Jewish scholar says this is how the Jews have consistently interpreted the Old Testament. We say this is how the Christians have consistently interpreted it. I agree with you on that level, but you see, Christian interpretation, I I see. If you do, then I'm along with you. This is my level. All right. Are we going to get that settled now? You know, I just just wanted to ask you about this in in this morning's edition of the New York Times. Uh... Past, according to an article, uh, pastors warned on advisor jobs. Protestant ministers who forsake their pulpits for careers as personal counselors were warned today to look before they leap. And uh, this was a meeting of some religionist theists uh, in Charlotte, North Carolina. And they feel that... Uh, the minister should not act as a personal counselor. How do you feel about that? If you do not have the qualifications which are necessary for pastoral counseling, I know because when I got interested in this particular field of study when I was at NYU, I went to Bellevue and took the pastoral psychiatry course, which is tremendously uh, valuable, working with psychiatrists and with those who are interested in abnormality and mental illness. It's no joke. It's a hard job. You spend three years 
getting the background of the material. And uh, it's you have to learn basic depth psychology. You have to learn some concepts of psychotherapy. And uh, in doing this, uh, you learn one of the most important rules is don't dabble with a person's psyche, with a person's mind. And don't play at being a counselor when you don't have the qualifications of the background. I don't care if you're a minister or not, rabbi or priest. It does not necessarily fit you because of your office to be able to understand mental illness, uh, people who are suffering from psychosis, or things of this nature. And I think I would agree wholeheartedly with what the Times is saying, and uh, I think that nobody has a right here's, to dabble in something without a background. Here's another thing that's interesting about this article. The Lutheran official warned that there were dangers in personal counseling, among them the possibility of legal action. The counselor and those responsible for his clergy status, he said, may be held responsible wholly or in part for acts committed by a client. And he added, it is possible to sue for malpractice, especially if the background of the counselor is open to question although reputable counselors carry heavy insurance to protect themselves, most clergymen would not qualify for such protection. That'd be pretty tough if a minister had to carry some type of uh, insurance, malpractice insurance, well, for giving you, wrong guidance to a, a parishioner. If huh? a minister got into the realm of mental illness, and with a theological background and no training, as I pointed out before, and started giving a person. Oh, no, no, come on, no, don't, but don't <laughs> join up, please. Come on, look at this already. <laughs> Three o'clock, he's, he's ready to <laughs> be look, accepted. Look, look, we don't need any passport pictures. Thank you. <laughs> uh, you want? Do you, do you want to get? Go. Do you want to get my good side? Which one do you want? <laughs> no, actually, uh, uh, Roy just got on his knees to take some photographs, and I thought that this was hoping that you. But for a moment, I thought we. Look, you, you had, had a conviction here. That's right. That's right. I think he was a convert. Listen, listen, you think he's taking photographs. He's not on his knees for that. You know, he's, he's seen the light. That's uh, you, what do, I thought. you do a very good job, Reverend Martin. A very good job. I got to commend you. Uh, I think that a man, regardless of his uh, training, whatever his prestige in the clergy is concerned, if he starts telling a schizophrenic who's really m ter desperately mentally ill that uh, in terms of theology, what's wrong mm -hmm. with them, and that person picks up a particular facet of this and it increases their aberration to the point where they're liable to do almost anything and this has happened something like an I eye for an eye I think this is wrong definitely wrong well, look, after all, an eye for an eye is what we practice in our electric chair. Whosoever sheds the blood of man, by man shall his blood be shed. You believe in capital punishment? That is why. I believe that if a man commits deliberate murder, and it can be proven that this was cold-blooded and premeditated in accordance with the, what the Scripture says, that it is perfectly right to execute him. Well, wait a minute. I'm sorry. Go ahead, Eden. All right. I, I, this is what I want We don't want to miss this one, because this is where you're doing. <laughs> or should we no, save uh, this for you, another you five You remember hours? that I said to Reverend Martin before that uh, Christianity was not being practiced now, that people who call themselves Christians have really gone back to the Old Testament. And uh, well, our Lord Reverend never Martin, by that. saying, by, he said, but I say unto you, there are only two commandments, love your neighbors, love God, you know, and your neighbor. Mm -hmm. And uh, the, also, what about the Sermon on the Mount? Well, may I go one step uh, further? And uh, he, didn't he say there, as it, it is said of old, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth, but I say unto you. All right. Um, may uh, I, so this is what real Christianity is about. the same book that gave me the Adam and Eve, though. Yeah. Can, can I, I let go, uh, uh, can I Reverend go uh, Martin further? continue, please? Could I go one step further with that thought, Eden? Uh, what you're basically saying is that uh, you really shouldn't execute people because this is eye for eye and tooth for tooth. You should really exercise love in the context of Christ's teaching. Uh, we can go one step further. Christ never abrogated civil law. In fact, he commanded observance to it. Uh, our Lord said it was wrong for a person to steal, and if you stole and didn't pay your debts, you would end up properly punished. Uh, this may not come under the heading of eye for eye and tooth for tooth, but it does come under the heading of justice. And uh, I'm not going to have to go to the Ten Commandments or to uh, the Decalogue which, or, or to the um, Torah, the first five books, eye for eye and tooth for tooth. I will go back further than this. I will go back to Eden to Cain and Abel outside, and I will say that uh, when Cain slew his brother, the Lord said, Long before Mount Sinai, Whosoever shall shed the blood of man, by man his blood shall be shed. Capital punishment was a divine decree for murdering an individual. Now, you may not want to... Aren't you supposed to forgive? Pardon? Aren't you supposed to forgive? But there is such a thing as justice. Forgiveness does not absolve an individual from the just duties 
and obligations which he may incur. For instance, you steal $100,000 from a bank. Yeah. Now, the president of the bank says to you, well, I forgive you for doing it. I really do. I mean, uh, but my depositors insist under the law that you stand trial for stealing the hundred thousand dollars you'll stand trial yeah now, there's no of course we're not taking no, a life away there's no incompatibility here i'm just following yeah, i know but we're not May taking a life that's away that's correct but capital punishment i think will stand in scripture let me uh interrupt for a moment uh unfortunately Sorry. what what are you doing you got a program promo, too. What do you think I was doing for the last three minutes here? Oh, I see. Sorry. Haven't I been talking about the program, what we're doing? See how silly I am? You think this is a fairy tale or something? <laughs> you think this is a that's, novel that's I'm, I'm a trying myth, out don't for you? science? That's a myth, that's is a right. Myth. <laughs> what was this story... Uh, uh, pardon me. Eden the Grey. Yes. What was this story about the Holsers? Awful people? Well, John, I just was shocked, and almost everybody that I've talked to since... And you only uh, talk to a certain class of people, even, you know. We're shocked by Mr. and Mrs. Holzer's point of view about life, <clears throat> that they were only interested in, each one said they were only interested in themselves, not in other people, and they thought of everything only in relation to themselves. They didn't care. Isn't um, this true of most everybody, but they no, were honest enough to admit No, it? no, no. You are now at the level of one of the great German philosophers, Max Stirner, who in his book, The Ego and His Own, said exactly that, and he was honest enough to say it, yeah. and they probably were too. That's right. That's it. I admit this. I admit it. You see, the thing is, Eden, first of all, they're two very lovely people. Very lovely people. Well, there I are many things that they, they say that the I don't know. Uh, many things that that they said that that I don't agree with. Certainly, I don't agree with uh, uh, with uh, yeah. James Avery Joyce. Uh, 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 the, the many things Joyce goes so so far out. However, that's Joyce, that's why I have Joyce on. That's his right, and the same with the Holzer's right. Well, you, uh, Joyce Go sounded good compared to this. Well, now, if we're talking about their ability to articulate, no, I no, think that no, they were I'm both their all ideas. Equals I'm on talking the show. about their ideas. Yeah. Uh, I, I've known Joyce and had him on uh, uh, James Avery Joyce many times. He's uh, a very articulate man. But you know what I said it, earlier, yes. <clears throat> John, about the fact that I think that this is uh, probably the freest platform in America for divergent opinions.